Right? Welcome this back. is going to be. Oh, oh you got right, it. You doing it? Whatever. <laughs> we never actually discussed that. You can do it then. Go for it. All right. Welcome back dude, to the four horsemen. Dude, dude, let's all do one at the same it's time. Dan, Dan, and have you ever done an intro? <laughs> I have not I mean, at all. Go for it. Let's do it. Actually, you should just do an intro yourself. Just introduce yourself and the show. Who are yeah, we? I want to see what you think. What would you say? Go on. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Four Horsemen. Today we're going to be discussing the state of America's law. But before I get into that, let me introduce everyone. Myself first. <laughs> I'm Danan, a longtime League of Legends general manager for a handful of teams. Uh, now just like an esports, you know, extraordinary talent manager guy. Uh, and I'll pass it around first over to Monty. To, to, to any better intro than any actual real intro we ever did have on the show. Yeah. We don't no even introduce anyone normally, so well done. We already succeeded. Uh, yeah, as usual, Richard Thornton and myself here to discuss. So you guys, basically, uh, Riot has now announced some... Additional information about the Americas region. We wanted to get Dana on here because he's worked in the LCS for a number of years as a general manager to get his take on a lot of the changes that are occurring. Uh, we've seen the rumors uh, that Immortals and um, NRG are going to be exiting the league. So earlier we saw, like a year ago, we saw LCS get trimmed from 10 to 8 teams. Now it's getting trimmed from 8 to 6 North American teams. And of course, the guest spots that are going to be coming into the league, including one from Latin America, the bifurcation of the league into Northern Conference and Southern Conference, which means that CB Lowell, which is the Brazilian league, is also getting culled down to six teams. They are going to receive a Spanish-speaking Latin American team and a guest slot as well. So both North and South Conferences will have eight teams, allegedly. Mm. And we're moving to the three split system, which means that we're going to get crossover tournaments galore between Brazil and North America. Uh, North the LCS fans are very angry that their garbage region is getting docked a slot at international events. And it's being given to the Brazilians instead, even though, you know, they kind of do the same at international events, if we're being honest. Um, and uh, oh, so what, what else we got, guys? It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. There's about 20 different things, but I want to jump on something at the front of this because it's not going to be a major topic for us, but it's like a cool aside. And by cool, I mean hilarious. I'm not sure if you followed uh, a couple things. First, VCT Ascension. And I know that's not League of Legends, but there's there, there's like an end game to this. Uh, and then uh, the new America's Challenger event, which is basically they took the NACL uh, top two, grabbed the Brazil Latin American champions and threw them all into a LAN event for like the first time ever. With no stakes whatsoever. There's this cool guest slot coming next year. Don't think or care about it because they're not using it yet. This this is just like a, we're sorry that we're changing this system and that you're not a benefactor to it, so here's a land somewhere. Here's the hilarious part, as is the most obvious thing ever. Uh, we should have called VCT Ascension, probably VCT Descension. We probably should have just called America's Challengers just America's Descension. Because the North American teams have all choked uniformly across the board. M80, TSM, uh, Fear Star Forge, and Maryville all lost to Brazil. Uh, across the board, Brazil won both events. <laughs> That's great. We are, now, so v we are a minor VC region. It's yeah, happening. VCT Ascension, by the way, guys, is the Valorant. Um, basically, they have the guest slots in Valorant as well. So, you know, LCS is moving towards becoming more like the Valorant model. And so there are guest kind of partner positions um and that's what they were fighting for in ascension is a promotion relegation system basically mm. um and then the the challenger is the tier two america scene uh and this included you know collegiates uh, it included uh academy teams right danan from yeah, most notably FlyQuest and team liquid um mm -hmm. which we'll also talk about because it seems like maybe those academy teams from the pro teams are not going to be viable moving forward either so there's a lot of a lot of changes here uh let's start though with with the biggest news which is everybody's favorite lcs franchises immortals <laughs> you know the best part and, and you really said that with a straight face well What's done it's like look at one point in this episode we will probably recreate what we did that skit that we did on some of the insight about how everyone keeps saying well i did an rg by clg spot and then leave which is literally every fact that you just mentioned that sentence is wrong and is inverted on the actual yes. priority of what happened but that'll be separately the immortals one we have to start with monty because in some ways <laughs> the reason why it is so perfect that right before the 
the death knell of the LCS, Immortals fucks off, is Immortals are the ones who started the game of chicken with the salaries. That <laughs> probably destroyed the whole reason is why LCS now not only went from, remember, I always point this out, it not only was one of the most viewed regions in the world, but famously, when they made franchising, it's not a joke, he meant it, Carlos from G2 wanted to actually move G2 from Europe to America because he thought it's the bigger league and there'll be way better opportunities for like making revenue and sponsorship opportunities. So like, if you think about where the league was when Immortals was running game and get paying people those crazy salaries, like essentially, the, as I pointed out last year with the economics, they're part of the reason why eventually there was like every team had lost like $5 million or something insane or $10 million over the years in the LCS. So even though they're not to blame entirely, they were the ones who started that whole game and started pushing out the number and making all the bidding wars. go. So it's kind of fitting that they fuck off now when the thing's dead at the end of the LCS. They've yeah, accomplished fair. their mission. The well, sleeper, well, the Manchurian candidate was activated. <laughs> fucking... So <laughs> so, Dan, I want to hear your take on being an LCS uh, when Immortals entered, because like I was yep. a team owner when this happened. And so I, yep. I unfortunately firsthand experienced uh, the <laughs> right. massive spike in player salaries that they created. What was your take on uh, the Noah Winston era and the random giant amounts of payments that he started giving the players? So what's funny is I actually don't blame Noah. I blame... Kind of the, the collective that was the owners, you included, Monty, but I don't know, I don't remember where you landed on this issue. Noah, while obviously being irresponsible with his spending, being the first one, of course, everyone joined in. Like, literally everyone, every single person, every entity across, not just League of Legends, the entire esports ecosystem kind of collapsed into that same trap. And I don't think there was going to be this magic, like, if Noah didn't do it, nobody would have ever done it. I actually think I our that. biggest issue with this was we massively inflated the salaries and there was no accountability because we couldn't quite get transparency of salaries across the finish line. I think if there was more visibility on what owners were spending, because those were who were coming in and saying like, hey, we're just going to like go like 10x over what our original estimates were because like we just really want to win that bad or we care that badly. I think there probably would have been a lot more pressure, obviously, from, from the people actually financing all of this, the investors. There would have been way more pressure from the public. And then funny enough, uh, I put a lot of the onus here on Riot. I think Riot probably would have stepped in, because they did eventually, right? They stepped in and started putting more guardrails on the systems. But I don't think they genuinely had, like, a great read. I think they checked in once a year with their usual, like, hey, like, what are your estimates? What do your numbers kind of look like? And they collected those summary sheets. But they didn't really, like process that out to the wider team it was mostly like the league ops team kind of had a good idea and then as you went deeper into riot they were like ah, it's like we, we have estimates that kind of stuff i think we kind of missed our window of building a system that was gonna like insulate ourselves from that and it was just just chaos for for the last like eight well, years from there on out I'll, I'll i'll do you one better on that point uh and, and this is a fact that people can go and check um riot actively encouraged the salaries being higher because it mm -hmm. made their league look better they yeah, were they, they they put out in a number of public statements this is what the average salary is isn't that incredible which was, i mean that was flawed in and of itself because you had these stupid noah winston type salaries at the top end inflating the average to make it sound like every league uh, of legends player was on six figures which absolutely wasn't the case um mm -hmm. but riot liked having the salaries as big as they were because it made them uh, be able to go out and say look how incredibly sustainable our ecosystem is wow we can pay a dog shit player three hundred thousand dollars a year and um you know for me this is this is just a it's the great folly of riot in in general at that if i'm running a esports ecosystem and we get a ton of venture capital coming in, and we get incredibly young owners managing this venture capital, and I start hearing about players I know to be mediocre, because I made the fucking game, right? So I know, right? Uh, and I hear that they're making six-figure salaries, high six-figure salaries, in an ecosystem that prior to that point was supporting 20,000, you know, 50,000. Yeah, it was probably like 50. <laughs> Yeah, right? Like, I, I, I'm probably going to say something, and I'm going to get all of the owners in a room, and I'm going to go, guys, let's not kill the fucking goose that laid the golden egg, yeah? Let's not do that, right? And and put the stymie on it right at the start. But obviously, well, 
Mark Merrill and, and his ilk love to bask in the publicity look, of, look at this incredible world we have built. We have built a utopia there was... for streamers and players. And so, you know, every oh, their downfall is totally deserved every time it happens. And I'm, and I'm I mean, look, there, there are several things I think to respond to to this, which is that there was an assumption. So you have to you have to understand that there was there was a lot of stuff that was going on this era. So first off, this was the era of LCS viewership when it was like 300,000 concurrent average. Um, yeah. And right. And so, like, we're like north of 600, 750,000. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So like <laughs> LCS was hugely popular at this time. And there was there was a reasonable assumption uh, that sponsors were actually going to come because the, the issue that Riot has had was that they missed the boat on sponsoring mm -hmm. at the biggest times. So there was an assumption that yes, there is going to be more sponsorship dollars. There was also very critically the uh, MLB BAM media deal Bam that Tech, was supposed yeah. to be the BAM Tech yep. deal that was supposed to be like $300 million or whatever. Um, and so there wait, was wait, an assumption. What was the logic on that, Monty? How would that have been shared among people? Would people have got like a direct percentage cut when it just got into the revenue part? What was the logic on that? Yeah, that was never really clear to but the I mean, was that actually one thing that people think like we're basically going to make loads of revenue because they're going to get sure. deals, yeah. at the top level yes the general the general intention was going to be this pipes into the revenue pool to be clear it was there was no reality where it was going to be one-to-one -one. like every dollar yeah, that right. goes into the bam tech right. deal goes into the revenue pool it was going to be like you know some some fraction of that deal is like relevant to teams and relevant to the like, franchise maybe they get 30 percent or something yeah yeah something exactly like that. and yeah. then that yeah that was right. intended to run through right. the revenue pool. yeah yeah, and that never well, that was obvious. a massive deal. It was going to be for, like you said, much well, for a lot of money, right? You yeah. know, obviously, I broke that story. My understanding was it was essentially just going to, it was treated like a media rights deal, even yes. though it was yeah. more than that, because it was essentially going to be like a, almost like a Netflix. You know, yes. it was going to have programming on there, it was going to yeah. have the VODs on there, all of that. MLB stuff. TV. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. Exa exactly. And, and um, you know, it never. It never manifested, and and as again, as I reported at the time, the re, the the deal was all but agreed upon. But then, uh, it was the upper tier management at Riot that tanked that deal. They kept well, asking so, for more so and more. It was also that 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 Bam Tech got bought by Disney, and I think yeah. that Disney may have killed it. Yeah. Also, Disney killed yeah. it, and then Monty, you can probably speak to a question I've had for a long time, which was like, you said Riot missed the boat. My understanding and impression, but again, technically I wasn't in the room, it was just like the constant thing I was told was that they didn't miss the boat. They knowingly actively yeah. chose not well, to get on the boat. They saw the success they coming. They saw Blizzard well, yeah. the, in the, the review. The, Those the deals famous... were like getting floated and they were like, we can do better. <laughs> well, there was so there was an element of hubris about it, right? But this was yeah. like pre Blizzard. This was pre Overwatch League. Well, we're this talking was like, like pre Riot having a 2015 team, wasn't it? I mean, look, I mean, th this is the whole sad tragedy of like riots, incompetent esports management was that Dana, I mean, you, you heard this line because it was the only thing they would ever spout. We don't want to be NASCAR. <laughs> That's what they would say <laughs> constantly to you, yeah. which meant which as far as I could tell meant we don't want any advertisers whatsoever. Meanwhile, fast forward to 2024 Red Bull fucking barren power play. You know, Bud yep. Light, Ace, you know, they mm -hmm. did become NASCAR, which also means why were, why weren't they doing it before? I mean, the answer was that Naz was in charge of sales and she was ludicrously incompetent and they weren't actually using the resources of agencies in Los Angeles to I, do the deals. I, I will say for me, there were two other things that that kept getting tethered to one was uh, obviously Blizzard Overwatch built their biz dev team before they built their league. Yeah, and, and Blizzard so when, was also was made them very embarrassed because you know yes. for all of Owl's faults, their sales team was not one of them. Their when sales were, team fucking smashed it. <laughs> yes, when you were in the equivalent rooms, it was like a wholly different experience, right? Riot didn't have their biz dev team built out and like grown out, and like the intention of being super big and wide. But part of what is because of what you said, which was that they didn't want to do this like collaboration partnership, throwing logos and brands and everything. And what's funny is I think obviously, so Blizzard pressured them to want to do and be more because they're like, we're better than this product. We're better than the Overwatch League. So we should get more. And I think on the other end, eventually what happened is groups like Fortnite and Epic came in and said, oh no, we can just sell out. We can just put Star Wars in the game. We can just, like everybody wanted this stuff from League of Legends for years and would have been okay with it. But Riot was under the impression because all the major developers across gaming that was like a line none of them would cross, right? You remember like back when when Smite was huge and Han and Dota, all the MOBAs were big. 
none of them were doing any type of collaborative content. It wasn't until Fortnite popped up and started doing bigger things. And then Rocket League started throwing things. Like suddenly these developers said, okay, yeah, this is totally fine. We can actually integrate brands into directly into the IP and feel okay about it. I think if that had happened sooner, Riot probably would have caved and been on board with it, but they were really trying to hold that line that everyone else was. Um, and it just, it was, it was just the worst possible timing and it ended catastrophically as we're seeing across the board now. <laughs> so <laughs> immortals they, they, going beyond this. Cause I, Dan, I agree with you. I mean, it, I think it was inevitable that those salaries increase. And yep. what we're talking about here is that it was really like the Hooney and Rainover deals coming in from mm -hmm. fanatic. And you know, it, it, this sounds quaint now, but those salaries by today's standards are nothing. I mean, they were like two, two fifty, two hundred. Oh, yeah, immortals saved 000. money. If they made franchising, and we're able to hold those contracts through, they actually would have been probably a middling cost team uh, yeah. while winning championships. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, there was a point, guys, where the not the average, but the median salary of LCS, like a couple of years later, was like 600K. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we're it's talking like about 50 something. Yeah. You know, so having having a player like Hooney even a year later on a two hundred thousand dollar deal would have been a very good contract. And like it was just destined to go crazy. And you can say, oh, well, Noah Winston and Immortals started this, but it was going to hit go through the roof anyway. Right. And that was the problem. But these were the factors that I think oh, were only because of the people in involved. Drop a million. Well, <laughs> It, it would have happened before Rick. I mean, like the, the problem yet, yeah, like the, the problem with the salaries was the, it was an opportunity for these team owners to basically live a, a sports owner fantasy, and none of them had the discipline or foresight to not well, spend the money to get the players they, they wanted because they all wanted to lift trophies but, and they thought big spending they, was the way to do that. The, pro the problem is, is that they had to take venture capital to pay the franchising fees. And then mm -hmm. they, you have to let the VC people under your board and the people on the mm -hmm. board are pressuring you to win championships and they are approving these salary deals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Right. And yeah. there's also people, like one person in a room. This was like groups of people saying, yeah, let's do this. The board, the boards of these companies would have to like approve these contracts. Right. Uh, or approve the budgets at the very minimum for the, for the league of legends team. And also you have to understand that there is another pressure that these VC these these VC funds were putting on, which is that they want you to spend money. The whole thing about VC is they want you to deploy the capital because what they want to do is buy more of your company, right? Mm. And so they kind of there's two there's two things like they want to win titles and they want to explode the market and like make it bigger because that increases the valuation of the leagues and therefore the the valuation of their asset. But they also simultaneously want you to spend that money so you come back and dip into the well again because if they think it's going to be successful they would like to own more of the thing and it doesn't matter if they have to give you another 10 million dollars if they're thinking in five years they're going to get 50 or 100 million back from mm -hmm. that 10 million yep. so yep. like it really was i mean this is this is just how vc works is that they they do drive try and drive insane valuations they do dump a bunch of money in because they only need one in a hundred of their investments to work and if it works, it works so big that it more than covers their losses and leads to enormous profit. Is it a healthy system? We can debate that, right? But this is the reasoning why a lot of this was happening. And, you know, Riot wanted the VC to enter the ecosystem. And it did in a big way. Like Immortals was backed by Meg Whitman, who's a Hollywood executive, and Lionsgate, which is a Hollywood mm -hmm. production company, you know. Um, and, you know, these people were were really trying to push, uh, you know, the, these, these kind of, um, you know, big spends. And, you know, it's not just them, obviously. Like, all the teams were, were yeah. forced to take, you know, like 12 venture major capital, basically. Yeah. All major, collapsing yeah. on the league at the same time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think when we look at Immortals, like they clearly wanted back in. Now, Immortals, I think, went through a variety of, you know, strategy and leadership changes. Like we're yeah. not going to get into the history of Immortals here, but it is kind of crazy that they like bought Optic, then sold Optic. Um, <laughs> you know, they, 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 they still own MIBR. You know, they never, I think, had a coherent strategy. I mean, with Immortals, what was so weird was they appointed a new CEO who is a sales guy from Gen G named Jordan Sherman. And then he decided to do this like great lakes play where they Michigan. became like the team of Michigan, mm. despite yeah. being in Los Angeles and like yeah. having no ties to Michigan. Like he was trying to localize them without them even being local. So there 
a lot of just weird. I mean, look, that was the that was like the last stage and and the hail mary. But I know as much as team hate teams hate immortals, I think the thing about immortals that is important to understand is that they were never business stupid, really. Yeah. Um, it, they still it, have at least partnerships, it, except for that LCS application. Except they don't even <laughs> exist anymore. <laughs> no, 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 no. Partnerships. In the, dur during the post Noah Winston oh, era, right. that was yeah, Noah yeah, Winston. Yeah, yeah. You are correct. Right. Right. I mean, okay. I now I, I got to be honest. I, I mean, like I don't agree with that assessment at all. I, I I think that like I don't know how you could look at their strategy and 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 think that. Like, because, what what do their what do immortals have to show for all of the money that they've spent and all of the time they, they've put in? Realistically, so so there's there's two eras. There's the Noah Winston era and the post Noah Winston era. I would yeah, say yeah, I'm, I was talking very much about the post Noah Winston oh, era. I'm talking about at least the acquisition in terms of, of optic and all. Oh of no, this no, no, nonsense. in League of Legends, the way they've operated yeah, oh, the right, League of Legends right. division specifically. No, I, I think there was a lot and, of well, weirdness. Just, obviously, we can put this in vacuum. Let's talk exclusively immortals. Yes. And Immortals is not IGEC. It's just yes. like separate from MIBR, separate from LA Valiant, separate from mm. Optic. Okay. Just, just the League yeah. of Legends LCS yes. run. Yes. 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 Because yes. they've been running at a profit, basically. Fantastic. It is a business, hilariously. I mean, I mean <laughs> yeah. it's assumed for, especially if people don't okay, know, that, I know what Monty means. I know what Monty means. The problem is if you divide them into two and you have the Noah Winston era, which is what we're talking about, it's all this exorbitant spending and almost like daring everyone in the industry to do that. It's that everyone's high on the VCT, et cetera. The era after that is basically when they did look like they did a million min maxes in the LCS for years yes. and years and years. Yep. And yep. if you yep. don't know, the main angle they took wasn't even a terrible angle. They tended to just find people who were good European coaches just like Zabatine and what's his name? Fucking uh, Andre. Uh, yeah, Gyoto. Like Gyoto, Gyoto. And they, they gambled that these guys could sort of pick the talent and do like reasonable deals. By the Most way, recently I have a little... an arrow. Yeah. Yeah. So those ones aren't that bad, actually. But all I will say, as, as I imagine, this is also why people spent money. They had fuck all results in that era, of course. They never even came close to sniffing yeah. like a title or a final. So unfortunately, that in itself is part of the problem, okay. right? Is people paid to get championships and to get into finals. We're going to talk about this, but what's really funny is they had a really interesting, again, probably correct business strategy in retrospect, yes. which was they called Riot's bluff. Riot put in that like soft thread of like, hey, if you get, if you trend at the bottom of the league too often for too long, we can pip you. And if we pip you and you still don't sort it out and we aren't happy with your business plan, yes. we can check you out a window, right? That was like, and they just said, no, you won't. And they, were yeah. right. they, they just said, no, yeah. you won't. And they just the ran with it, and they are now like arguably the team that burnt the least amount of money, and yep. so far have had what looks like probably going to be the cleanest exit, like yeah. across the board, hilariously yeah. enough. And, and the thing, the thing about Immortals, and, and like people can people can get mad at Immortals, I guess, if you want, for not producing content that anybody watched, not making themselves likable, not fielding competitive teams. But you know, the question is. Where, what is the business? What is the actual dollars and cents business reasons for doing any of those things? Because there was no incentive program like in Valorant or like there will be in League of Legends for fan interaction. Uh, basically, the only time you actually saw meaningful sponsorship increases is if you made it to international events. So the difference yeah. between fourth and 10th is basically nothing. And you say meaningful, but it wasn't enough to cover the gap, just to be clear. No, like it meaningful yeah. was not enough to cover the like insane hurdle you had to leap up to actually get to the international stage. Yeah. Yeah, basically, if you were going to Worlds, you would have to spend millions of more dollars, but you weren't going to get millions you more dollars. You like one and a half to two. If you yeah. could do it in real time and you had a team for it, which a lot of teams didn't have like a great biz dev team. Right. Mm. Um, you know, not everybody's like team liquid with their yeah. sales team. You know what I mean? Um, so it, basically the problem, the problem that, you know, that immortal showed is that immortals is basically sitting there saying to riot, give us a business reason to spend more money. And riot never did. And so people getting angry at the teams or cheering that the teams are leaving, I really think is the wrong approach because if there was ever a good business reason to put more money in to receive more money, Immortals would have done it. They ran, ran what was effectively a sane business sitting on an asset that they were paying for, and they said, okay, we're just going to run profitably based on this stipend. And, you know, Riot can do things. Like, if Riot doesn't like the situation – they can change it, which they are, which is why we're seeing incentives based on, you know, fan base in the in the new team participation agreement, because that is being, you know, that's what's been hammered out this year is that basically the first time that the teams and Riot have renegotiated the contract that binds them in franchising was this mm -hmm. year um, ever since franchising began. So we're moving into a new era and why Immortals is 
I assume selling now is because the base, the floor of the stipend is going down. And even though mm. the ceiling is approximately, you know, the same. So la this, this last year they've gotten paid like two and a half million. So the stipend went up because of esports winter and the team's freaking out. Um, you know, it's going back down, I think to about a million and a half and there are incentives to make more money. But as I understand it from talking to people, those incentives are very difficult, if not impossible to reach. So most teams are kind of like dialing it back. And if you want to hear, you know, conversation about that and, you know, the Jojo Pian thing, I think is absolutely about that. You can go <laughs> listen to our last Summoning Insight episode, which is like the teams are starting to re rein expenses back in because now they know what the TPA is going to look like going forward. Yeah. Um, so there has been a contract change. But as far as Immortals goes, like for the last <clears throat> bunch of years, they've basically just been coasting you know, breaking even or making a small profit off of the League of Legends team, which is like where if you're a fan, you should want the teams to be like mm -hmm. you should want the teams to, okay. to be operating sustainably. And that's what Immortals is doing. Like, I'm sorry, guys. That's what sustainability looks like in League of Legends. You may not like it, but that's what a well-run team looks mm -hmm. like. Like you should be blaming the fucking ecosystem and the business realities of working with shitty ass Riot Games, not Immortals. Right, here's the thing. I'm not on an episode of, he's even, as if the irony couldn't be thicker, the fucking, he is the LCS commissioner. I'm not on an episode of the blame game where what I do is I decide one person is to blame so it's not the person I like and then give 50 <laughs> different, like, sort of disingenuous arguments. I think actually everyone can carry some blame in this particular topic. So don't worry. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think he can sort of go, right? You know Noah Winston and that? Yeah, yeah, you know, after him, after he, like, spent, like, good, more money than the entire history of esports collectively in, like, two or three years. Well, after that, though, if we start now, then they've done a really awesome job. It's like, that that doesn't work, man. That's like saying that the guy after the, the Titanic was crashing made an awesome lifeboat. It's like, that doesn't work, man, because he originally had a Titanic. You know what I mean? He fucked up having a Titanic. Having an all right lifeboat afterwards doesn't really weigh up. So first of all, there's that. So I, I will agree on this level. You don't only blame the teams. That's why, if you notice, it sounded last year like I was the biggest fan of the team orgs ever and fuck all the players and riots. No, that's because because last year, I even told you this would happen last year. I told you if you play chicken and you push these owners, they will exit the game. They will exit this game. They will put all their resources into other games like Valorant, like Rocket, or whatever else. And if you dare them, by the way, in this scenario where they can even like force Riot to give them some money, they will just say, I'll take the money and I won't keep bleeding out millions every year. I'll be off. So I already thought that was mad because the reason why I can't handle that is if you notice, I like arguments, whether I agree with them or not, to be logically consistent. They have to start with the first principle of what you think is the way the world operates and they must build out of that and they must coherently refer back to the first principle. So if the entire premise of the walkout last year was that owners are selfish and greedy and want money and all they want is more profit and more money and more revenue then telling them they get less and less and there's no way to get more and in fact they're getting even less now and they're only losing money and then also telling them and by the way you're a piece of shit to blame for everything. At that point it doesn't even work coherently. If there was money to what? If I'm greedy and there's money to be got, then I'd be staying. It'd be the opposite, wouldn't I? Yep. So if I then say, actually, you know what? You're right. Enough's enough. Fuck it. I'm out. Then, then that means your original premise never made sense. I've always made this point. You were using a framing based on like workers' rights from when literally like factory owners exploited people. That was never the setup of an LCS org. In this analogy, by the way, the person exploited was the investors into these orgs. They're the ones who lost tens of millions of dollars. The players never lost a single cent. They only made, by the way, I'm going to say, if you actually look at the World of League of Legends, I think LCS players probably on average made 10 times more than any reasonable market value. So I'll get to that in a second as to why I actually think the biggest failure of the LCS was. And actually, here's what's funny. I will agree with you. I actually think Immortals held the key for the real way the LCS should have run, but I'll get to that in a second. So quickly, I'll go over these issues. The thing you said at the beginning, I agree. The craziest shit they ever did in the LCS was bragging about the average salary. Because first of all, we all know they intentionally banked that they were using Fugazi accounting where it's like the old joke we've all heard that if Bill Gates is in a room with us three then on average we're all like multi-billionaires <laughs> aren't we but yeah. the joke is none of us have a billion just Bill Gates has so many right so they were first of all using that joke so when they said the average we all know that wasn't the median player because you had Bjergsen and you had Hooney and you had these people <laughs> making the millions of bazillions and the sword arts of the world so already that average number wasn't the median guy anyway even though we were trying to give off to a fan that that's just you know most of them probably make this so 
sorry you played a game there. And the reason why it's so stupid is thinking that at the time, you're, what they didn't get at the time, which is crazy to me, is like all American fucking business systems, they're all based on infinite growth, which is literally, to my definition, impossible. So what you do is you don't go, hey, I'm in a, I'm in a fucking bull market right now for crypto. You go, crypto's this big, probably only going to get a thousand times bigger. And you never, ever account that you're in the sweet spot. And accordingly, you just assume it's going up and up and up and up. So when they bragged about how much the, the money they were paying to players were, what I think is crazy is that's actually the craziest self-report ever to real sports owners not to get involved in esports because you know what even though he's one of the people that Richard gets triggered by I actually do agree that Mark Cuban's initial assessment of esports was 100% accurate what he said was I because remember he's someone who jumped into a lot of tech areas first he said I looked into it and then basically I was like there is no revenue source here like your revenue can't be sponsorship because I know from the Dallas Mavericks that's a tiny fraction there has to be broadcast rights deal there has to be ticket sales there has to be merchandise until all these things are like metrics are big enough it doesn't make sense. Well, here's the reason why to someone like that, you fucked up completely bragging about the money because you're bragging about a number, which even if you factor in inflation, it's like what a star player in the NFL would have made in like the 1990s, but you don't have yep. the whole NFL machine. You don't have the ticket sales of what Dallas Cowboys Stadium is going to be like. You don't have broadcast rights that are millions and millions of dollars for all the cable channels and international station. You don't have people who are going to buy so many kits with that star on that you're going to make millions. You don't have any of those factors. So what you're actually doing when you brag and say, hey, the average salary is like 500,000. You're telling someone like Mark Cuban, no point coming in this business, mate. That's why I have to pay the players and you don't make money. You lose money running the team. That's a terrible brag. That's a brag that gives away what esports always was. It was a bunch of middle management people pretending they were the big Don Boss guy doing all the business deals like some Wall Street 80s movie fantasy. So already that was so naive a move to do. Then secondly, I can tell you, it wasn't even just the famous examples like Hooney and Rainover where Nor Winston just got too horny with his checkbook and overpaid. Because if people don't know, the stories about them are worse than it even sounds on the surface. He didn't just overpay them. It's not that there was a market and the value was X and he paid, you know, 1.2 X, right? No, no. The story goes when he would go to people, he again was living out some LARP fantasy that he is like some bazillionaire and that's his money. And he was apparently going and doing stuff like I'll offer you twice as much. Like some movie scene where you just do some cool thing where you shut it all down. Like, you know what? What do you want? 1.5? Let's just say three and end this with a cocktail. It was that sort of stupid shit. Well, the reason yeah. why that's so wacky is that's not a business decision, mate. I can tell you a business decision isn't even that. Like, if you think about the way they think about this popular concept of a game we all know, higher or lower, Right. When someone does higher or lower, the guy who sets the bar, if you want to go higher, you want to go higher by one because you know I only need to be one and I win. In that scenario, Nor Winston was doing a terrible approach to bidding because essentially, as far as I can tell you, was showing off that you could waste money. As we've now found out, there is no money to be wasted. Like That will be accounted for one day and there will be comeuppance. But it wasn't even just Hooney and Rainover. I did an interview not that long ago with a player called Ole who actually played with the later Immortals. Mm -hmm. He played in both. He played in the one that had Nor Winston and he played in the one afterwards. And in the interview, he straight up tells me he didn't want to join Immortals and kept saying no and when you find this out now, you will realize what a nightmare the LCS was. When he was saying no, Richard, it's like Noah Winston was on his Saudi bag because Noah mm. Winston thought, he's playing hard to get, isn't he? So he just kept coming back and increasing the number. But this yep. guy all it actually meant no, as in, I don't want to join. I want to stay in like, he was in the LMS in uh, Taiwan at the time. And what happened was eventually Noah Winston just kept putting the number up and all it was like, I guess I have to join, right? Yep. Can we just take a moment to take stock? Why are you <laughs> bidding? against yourself for a player who's even telling you, I actually on all levels don't want to come. I'll only come if you just make the number essentially so egregious. I have to say yes, because in that analogy, I'd be the idiot for saying no, which implies you're an idiot for offering me it. So already, by the way, that's just the general deals these people were doing. So it's yep. not just what people think, that they just pushed the level up. They sort of took the, the number and they pushed it out here and then other people caught them up. Don't worry about that. Yes. all I, As Monty says, all the people out there were eager to spend that fee 
and they were being told by the VC people, which, by the way, is itself a Faustian bargain for both parties. What you've done there is this. Look, I'd come in as a consultant and tell the VC guy, well, no, we don't want them to spend too much now. We want to be really careful. But the problem there is, I actually imagine there's a reason I wasn't in those rooms because the Jack Etty ends and Steve Arhan sets would be like, well, well, what do you mean, Thorin, that we don't want to invest now? No, 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 it's a ripe market. We should be. Like, that's exactly what they wanted to be told to spend money. So there's that angle because yep. that makes you not feel like you're complicit. Hey, I was being told to do it. It's your company, mate, at the end of the day. You have to carry the cam for your legacy. Then there's the whole aspect, which is another thing Nor Winston epitomized to me is when people LARP at being a sports owner, but they only understand the sport, they don't understand the business part of the sport, they will do classic moves, which are the right move for the sport and the wrong move for business. So the most famous example ever of this is the Carmelo Anthony trade from the Denver Nuggets to the New York Knicks. Because since he didn't want to wait until the end of the season and become a free agent, he wanted to go immediately because he just decided, like he'd just seen LeBron and all those guys go the year before and make all these super teams. He decided, I want out now and I want to start winning. I want to do what they did. I want to do my decision. So because he forced his way out and then simultaneously, the Knicks side was so horny to have him because he was one of the best players in the NBA. They famously gave up like most of their team to do it. And so it was, it was an example of right player, wrong deal though. Because even when you got that play, it didn't make you win and you'd blown all your squad. And it didn't make sense for either team basically in there, except maybe the Nuggets probably got loads of value out of it. And actually they did. They actually pivoted quite quickly and were a decent team again. Then lastly, I'll just throw this detail out there, which is the reason why the esports game changed for owners is because I think the key principle that held these guys in check in the first 15 years of esports was it was a business. They actually didn't have extra money. They didn't even have loans. They had to actually be able to make enough profit and revenue to spend on the things they wanted and not go bust at the end of the year and pay themselves a salary. So what happens is there actually was what is incredibly shady behavior in the 2000s. I can tell you, I worked for one yeah. of these teams. SK Gaming and a bunch of other organizations, I would allege, when the game World of Warcraft was the biggest game, it used to have like 100,000 viewers back when nobody could get 100,000. Like StarCraft would have been like 80K, CS would have been 40K. You know, they had the biggest numbers ever. So what all these owners did, I would say, SK, throw in whoever you want back there. I don't know the orgs, but I would imagine Fnatic, Mouse, Spot, you know, the big orgs of the time. They all got together for real in a room, I would allege. And they basically just said, we're going to agree. No, this doesn't leave this room, but we're going to do a soft cartel where what we agree is cause the viewership so high. We don't want to get drawn into a bidding war here, boys. Why don't we all just agree? Since the prize money is enormous from Blizzard in the WoW circuit, they just get the prize money and we all agree not to pay salary. So as a default position, none of us with our World of Warcraft 3v3 teams will be paying salary. And they all agreed to that, by the way. And as far as I know, that held for years. Now, look, that is completely illegal. If you're in California, we're going to do way, a little antitrust. That would, that would be some, that would be like somebody broke that you destroy the whole industry. But they did do it. But the reason why they don't do that in the modern day is because, as we said, there's different incentives back then. One in the modern day, it's not like I don't want to play chicken with you because I don't want to run the whole business down. Now we both think we have access to unlimited war chests of VT. And in fact, the better I am at getting VC, even though this isn't how it works, because you are selling your company, people even thought oh, I could just go get more. I can just go get another 20 million. And the logic really was, even though there is only in a finite amount of so your company you can sell, the logic was we can just keep going and getting bags of money and it'll just work. And so in that scenario, the game of chicken then becomes who can also like re-up next and who can get the next war chest and who can make a mistake now or who can buy the big player. And the worst part of all this, by the way, is to, to end, this is why it's so sad the LCS has died now. Because I actually think you're right. Immortals actually... They didn't quite crystallize it, but they did get what actually the best use of the money is. Let's see if we know the numbers from last year. Each team is making... I, I heard this year it's more. Apparently, the highest they'd ever been paid each org from Riot was roughly something like 2.2 .2 million or 2 million 2 or something. Yeah, yeah. It was 2 around something like that, right? That was the number back then. But at the time, everyone was losing. I was told let's say like a few hundred thousand to a million. Everyone lost that kind of amount, right? So if you're looking at the kind of metrics, it doesn't actually make sense from Fortune to do what people like Steve and Jack did, which is take more millions than everyone else is spending, put it onto star players, by the way, you still have to hope you win. You might fuck up like Cloud9 now and not even win, but like hope you win, win the LCS, go to... Because as we're seeing, that, that gets you the status and maybe that helps you get your next VC because you look better than the Immortals Org. But actually, that world's appearance doesn't make you the money. It doesn't make you the revenue. In fact, it costs money. As we're seeing, you just spend more money. The actual best use of the money, and I still can't believe that the LCS never figured this out, was especially in the early days, the LCS was the place to go. Not only did they have more money than the other regions like Europe and especially minor regions, but crucially, a 
lot of people, spoiler, don't want to live in Berlin. They want to live in LA where the weather is wonderful yeah. and there's all these, they have all these ideas about American movies if they're like from Poland or Czech Republic. So they, they have these notions of what it's going to be like to live there for quality of life, right? Essentially, you didn't ever have to overbid for those players. What you actually should have done for real, I'm not joking, if you go back in the time machine, is like immortals, it, the person you spend the money on is a coach with a scouting eye. Because the weirdest thing of all to me was this. With the mistake we always make with the LCS is we act like it's the NFL. And you can only sign American football players. No, no, you can't only sign NFL players. The genius of the LCS is you can sign any player who can come and join. The whole world is literally your oyster. And if there's one thing brilliant about League of Legends, there are infinite undiscovered talents out there. In fact, because of the ERL system in Europe now and in the Korean challenges, there are insane talents who, for real, would be the MVP of the LCS who you can get for almost nothing. So the actual better way to use that money is don't take three million and buy like a guy who could be on T1 because we already know he's super legit. You take the three million and you take like 500k and you hire like a basically a coach that can scout that player before he's the player on T1 when he costs 50k. Yeah or he costs 100K, or he'll come and sign a three-year deal for the 50K. You know, like, you could actually have done that. And Because the point I'm making here that people might miss is, if it's the NFL, then, yeah, I'm competing for a tiny talent pool, and whoever gets them is going to win, right? You actually even could have min-maxed and won if you'd have had a really great approach like this. Like, there are agents and scouts and coaches out there who have a fabulous eye for this shit, but that was never the route they took. Because, unfortunately, the easier approach is use the system of, I already know this player's famous and good. That's essentially like my attempt at due diligence so now my job is just to pay him the amount of money to come and play for my team but as we've said that actually was never what got you success either financially or even particularly in the game it was always a gamble even to sign these big names in the game so I think actually the, the real problem is look it's too late now and I don't claim I knew this all the time but the actual LCS approach was fundamentally flawed from day one throughout basically and they never seemed to ever figure out some of these aspects like they really did just think as long as there's another bag of VC coming just do a better job next time or something weird like that because again a lot of the blame to bring it back Monty a lot of the blame goes to Riot and like do they have the revenue and were they support like there's something there but at the same time what I've never understood is surely that margin of the revenue would never end this game because the game of chicken would just continue let's say now you make 10 million revenue instead of 2 million Monty wouldn't everyone just take the 10 million and now buy even more star players and import even more I, wouldn't it constantly have been the same game of chicken no matter what like I don't think you could have given these teams any amount as long as this was the mentality signing big name players for as much as possible then bragging about it to the world any amount of revenue would only have made it worse for these guys they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have ever been responsible right no i mean i think there probably is an inflection point where they just run at a you know a profit like a small you think profit. eventually they wouldn't have kept just keeping like both because no, no, i'm I... essentially essentially money i'm sort of arguing the famous counter argument to the idea of universal basic income which is that if you give people so, one thousand a month people will just put prices so, up and they'll just spend the one thousand a month that you'll be back I, at square I, I one think, you know i think what you're like a lot of the team leadership is going to want to run profitably at a certain point because they don't okay. want to sell more of their companies. Do you think VC. there was a magic number we could have got to? Is there a number? No, I, I don't know what that number to to Just to be work? clear, I think we 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 got there. J just so it's understood. Like I actually think, uh, I think we've been talking about it. Like we spent all the money we had. We absolutely did not. It wasn't even close. What actually happened is we pretty well hit like a. It was more like a barrier, I guess I would call it, of like how much of any individual franchise wanted to spend specifically on League of Legends, and we hit it. Like, we straight up, like, okay, like, my LCS expenditure is too high, and so what ended up happening is all the extra money, there was money. There was, I promise there was more money to give Sword Art. You would think it's not possible. There was absolutely more money to give Sword Art. And it actually just went to other games. Like, like overwhelmingly, you can go look, you can actually see in real time when this happened. Oh, yeah, Literally right. 20... Monty, they were using the TSM League money for all the games. It was, Mark it was 2017, 2018. Okay. I mean this very sincerely. 2017, 2018, if you go look at it, you can see where, like, the salaries hit that, like, uh, the me they said the medium was, like, 550 or something. But basically, the lowest paid player in the league was, like, $300,000, effectively. And that was probably where it was going to be and stay. And the upper bound was not going to go up anymore. It was like 1.5 and you weren't going to see any higher. They had the money and they would rather go spend it on other games and diversify and just build more for their company. Like we, we were straight up there. And if you go look at the other games, you can see a slight trend up in the salaries and uh, literally every other game that wasn't League of Legends in 2017, 2018, uh, because we hit that number. 
And then obviously but, everything kind of like found that, its way back. To be clear, clear, just though, for reference, in case people wonder, I would, again, you know, like I said earlier, where I was talking about if you were a Mark Cuban, you looked at the industry and heard that number, what would you think? I'm just going to put this out there. Similarly, if you're a George or Pion fan, just think about this, right? I looked it up and when I Google it, the CEO founder of Ikea makes something like $200,000 a year. Bro, we were paying fucking video game players in NA millions of dollars. Like the worst. Year. Like the, and that's it's crazy, not just isn't like it? Some. That's like literally the like, the, the the at the time 48 49 50th best players in the league probably yes. actually worse because there were probably the actual 48 49 50 players were in challenger being paid yeah. nothing and locked away from well, the even, bottom teams even some challenger players were still getting paid like 200k yes. or yeah, more yeah 250 300 almost yeah um but but to your point Dan, like the the movement of money to be absolutely clear was not from some sort of profit that they were making off no. of the league of legends no, no, it was no. just it was venture it was capital that was being it was just the de deployed other places so yeah. before you think oh my god they were making money on league of legends and spending it elsewhere no they were no. they had a bunch of money from vc that they were choosing not to inflate league of legends with anything. they pretty much discovered that north of about 1.2 to 1.5 million it didn't impact the player's decision on where they were going to play. Like the player that's picking between 1.5 and 2 million is not picking it for money. They're picking it because that's the team they want to play for. So if you were a team that was like offering 2.25 or 2.5 million for a player, most likely they just weren't willing to join you because you weren't a good team. Like, like you had the money, everyone had the money, but like you just weren't a good enough team. And that's why you started seeing like a pretty, pretty consistent, like, Liquid and C9, these teams, TSM, where they were landing players at 1, 1.2, 1. 1.4, 1.2. I mean, they need to pay the most, basically, yeah, it's the premise. Right? Yeah, but and it's, it was the like, same, it's the exact could have same, I can tell you, in CS, it's the same. G2 and Vitality yep. are giant orgs, but they never pay the most money, mate, because, as you're saying, if people want to play for G2, they'll play for G2 for 85% of the salary of the team they don't want to play for, you know? Exactly, yeah. So, basically, that was, like, that, that upper limit we started hitting, and then we never saw that talent find its way down because they would just go to the top team for one or one two instead of a bad team for one five, right? That was just, that was where we were at. Um, I do want to, like, take a moment. I, we're, we're probably far enough in now that I can start dropping some of the juicy stuff. Uh, right. So, I've got, I've got some breaking stuff that, that I, some of you might already be on top of, so I'm sorry if I'm, 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 ju I'm jumping ahead of you, but... Let's talk energy. Um, before we do this, before we do this, <laughs> if you are yeah. going to break some news or have some, you know, spicy information on your network, you may want to use our sponsor, ExpressVPN, uh, because you may not want that data collected off of a public Wi-Fi network or indeed, you know, your ISP can pretty much see everything that you do if it's not encrypted through a VPN. So if you're a responsible journalist uh, or, you know, just care about cybersecurity for yourself, which you probably should at this point in time, I don't know if you're traveling the world, if you're, uh, you know, raw dogging some public Wi-Fi networks, don't do that. Use protection, which is ExpressVPN. So you guys out there, we obviously have a deal for you. You can protect your online privacy today by visiting expressvpn.com slash horsemen, M-E-N, plural. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S, vpn.com slash horsemen, and you can get extra three months free, expressvpn.com slash horsemen. So thank you. It's protecting us right now while Dane is about to drop the juicy NRG information as we shift over to why NRG might have sold in this particular situation. So we're going to actually start at the beginning, and then we're going to get to the fun Ooh. part. So the first part is uh, a bit of a story to tell around their re-entry to the LCS. <clears throat> My understanding, and there was like inklings of this conversation, but never really like a, a fully like thought out explanation publicly. And they obviously they weren't going to cop to this. So they didn't pay to join right. the LCS, which everyone yep. knows. I think it was like Jacob Wolfer. Someone someone mentioned offhandedly on Twitter somewhere like, oh, it and was just clear, us. guys, this was an equity swap. So yes. MSG... The situation is this Madison Square Garden, they buy CLG. They're hemorrhaging money. They're spending millions and millions of dollars. And they're like, please make, will somebody not make the bleeding stop? NRG says, 
We'll take all your contracts that you've signed to keep running the team, and you will get an equity stake in NRG. Hooray for you. And they're like, okay, so no dollars are exchanged. MSG becomes a partial owner of NRG, presumably has a, has a board seat as well. I, I don't know that for sure, but yes, if do. I was – uh, they do? Yeah, if I was yes. MSG, I would Didn't insist on that. People even imply there might actually be in cash the opposite direction, like a small so, about so, whether CLG or something. Th this, this equity swap was actually step two of a three-step process. Ooh. The first step of the process failed. First step of the process, my understanding was energy was done. They were trying to sell. They were trying to exit outright. You saw them sell bits and pieces out. Bits you mean MSG? Like, no, 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 no. NRG was okay. NRG right. was, was done with to, what? Uh, existing. Okay. Oh, East primary, primary, I would assume okay. primarily eSport, but it might have included the content branch. Okay. That's unclear. My understanding is they were looking for their exit. They were trying to sell effectively outright to the tune of estimates were like 15, 20 million, right? This was pre-LCS. This was like pre-re-entry to the LCS. For the entire org, 15, 20 million. Yeah, some, somewhere in that range, oh, okay. right? Now, again, just it might have been like... No, I'm just thinking of like, those farm spaces like four years ago, like $200 yeah. million dollar valuation. And I, I tell you what, I'll take 15 million pod star style and get the fuck out. Like, <laughs> so it may Fair have enough. been... Again, this is where it's a little shaky. It may have been that they were only going to sell the esports division for right. that amount and like the content-y... Like, Maybe the streamers and, and the Benji Fishes yeah, in the world today, right? And okay. thing, that right. kind of thing. My understanding is they, they were looking for that exit from at right. least esports, if not the okay. brand entirely. Couldn't find it. Or at least couldn't find it at the valuations they were looking for. 15 might not have been what they wanted. That might have been their best offer. Right. Now, to be clear, they couldn't find it. They actually couldn't find a through line on this across the board. They looked for it, couldn't find it, and they said, okay, cool. What do we do to pump our valuation... So that like we're actually worth money so that we can actually sell. Because like right now, we just can't exit. Like we don't even have the option. And somebody was like, well, I know there's like LCS spots and they're like worth money. We used to be in there. And like obviously people are buying and selling. Like at this point, FlyQuest uh, had the new owners come in, spent a bunch of money doing it. Shopify had come in with TSM, that kind of stuff. Similar. These are all similar windows of conversations. And they said, okay, here, look. Huge brain idea. If we're going to dump the entire company anyways, let's just dump a bunch of the equity, who cares, for this, to give it to MSG, right? They want to board seat, again, who cares? It's a company that's not going to exist at the other end. Let's just go acquire an LCS slot that pumps the valuation, and then surely if people are buying LCS slots, they'll buy NRG that has okay, an actually, LCS you know, slot. Getting the LCS actually slot really presented smart. as like <laughs> fucking doing up the attic into a different room before flipping your house or something. For like, oh, I love the idea that's LCS. Yeah, it's, it's okay. house flipping, but LCS. And here's the insane part. My understanding is like, they obviously couldn't tell that to Riot. They can be like, hey, yeah, sure, we really yeah. want the LCS. We're really just coming in to leave, but like we really want in the LCS. So there's like clearly some obfuscation that was done through the process of like, well, why do you want to be here? What are you doing? What's yes. your intention? Why are you acquiring CLG? Of all? Why are you retiring the CLG brand of all brands in esports? I mean, just to be clear, in favor yeah, yeah. Like, of this like weird premise, merger equity the thing. That you're implying is obviously Riot doesn't want you buying in, but really just to instantly sell to some other third party yeah, immediately. Of course. Right? They want you to be like, their real partner going but forward. The genius so is they sold to Riot. And, <laughs> and the right. question is, the question is, it's it's like it's like did, did MSG know? Right. Did did like the CLG? Did the board know? Like, did Riot know? Like, there's so many people you have to ask questions around, and that's ignoring the fact that you're, if you're coming in on the immediate, you know what you're doing is you're one acquiring a bunch of LCS contracts, or two you're signing a bunch of new LCS contracts with staff, with players across the board, with the like potentially theoretical intention on the back end to just sell everything anyways and be in that weird limbo space where all these people lose their jobs. This is actually more thing. interesting than most of the bloody games. It's like Succession, but about like eSports. This is actually should, great. I love it. Yeah. This should be so, like a TV so, show. Yeah, keep going. This isn't even the most dramatic thing with respect to energy today. I'll drop the actual news now, okay. which is um, you're definitely familiar, Monty, um, and, and, and Thorne Richard, you might be familiar. This is just like a very active part of being in the, league, being in the LCS. The TPA has... Uh, basically these like installation, the, the, these like guardrails and rules to make sure that there's not abuse like what happened with Echo Fox and Immortals uh, right. or gaming in the past, which is if you leave the league, uh, you effectively have to sever your contracts with the players. They don't want you to be able to right. like 
all the LCS player after you're no longer an LCS organization. Yeah, in jail, like, like waiting for a buyout. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Which is what teams have done in the past. Yep. So yeah. there's like a built-in rule that says if your TPA is terminated, you must terminate all of your contracts with your players. This is meant to protect the players from being jailed away from the LCS, not to be used as a bludgeoning tool by teams on the way out of the league. Mm. NRG, the millisecond, the millisecond it was decided that they were going to be one of the teams gone, picked up the stick and started swinging. <laughs> right. And tried to terminate all of their players and staff using this TPA rule. Jeez. Hey, Riot said that we're not going to, we're not in the league anymore. So now we can terminate yeah. you. And it, it is an immediate for cause effect termination. Effectively, someone like get a, the, someone get the Photoshop, fire it up, do Andy Miller as a terminator. Well, so here's, term, the thing. here's the thing. Here's the thing. Yes, contract. <laughs> the only reason to do this is if you are like egregiously cash strapped, don't care about your brand, any of your public image anymore, because what you're doing is you're exiting, you're terminating contracts, you're not paying anyone out. No severance whatsoever. Basically, you're using Riot's TPA guardrail as, again, the bludgeoning stick to save yourself. Right. Not even and a this, lot of money, probably a pittance of money in the right. grand scheme of what's and, happened. And, and this is this is, by the way, um, the the payout, the buyouts that Riot put on the table this time were more. So it was six million in the last round when teams got out. It was eight to ten million this time. So it's not like to, to, to Danan's point, it's not like they didn't have an incoming massive amount of money to actually like yeah, give somebody a soft see, landing. Now, this now here's the thing. It. It's why I think I get why the LDS was such a fucked up environment. Like, as he says, it's not even like they did it and in doing so saved loads of money. It was like it made loads of sense. Everyone in everyone in the LCS American ecosystem and A-Sports a is like some demon leprechaun that because they caught you on some loophole in their bargains. Like, <laughs> we're, we're not even to the dramatic part yet. We're not even to the dramatic part yet. I want to add some quick notes to this. One, this actually probably wouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, the amount you would pay in severance typically would not be very much because okay. those contracts in the last two or three years, especially, which is how long energy has been around, um, have been signed and very organization favored because sal salaries have gone down. Players have been more willing to give up on okay. guarantees, right? Yeah. So the actual cost of exiting contracts for the most part is like almost nothing. It's a fraction of a fraction of what operating for a year is. But... NRG made a really interesting decision recently. They won an LCS championship and made the weirdest decision you've ever heard or seen anyone make, which is they fired their general manager. Now, to be clear, the general manager came from CLG, um, so obviously they didn't have necessarily a lot of loyalty to this person, but obviously this person had built a very successful machine and had won the LCS for what is probably the cheapest team in the history oh, of sure. the league, yes. right? Yes. Those were good contracts made by someone who obviously knew what they were doing and they won a championship because of it. They fired the general manager, chucked him out a window, didn't really entirely backfill the position. They like pseudo promoted one of the coaches to be the new manager type person. They also fired most of their coaching staff. That got yeah, here's, that where, here's where it gets funny. Because they did this, they didn't actually have someone helming it such that they could make good decisions moving forward. My understanding is they signed a bunch of not fantastic contracts to retain the championship talent. They didn't keep the championship GM who got them good contracts. They right. kept the championship talent, signed them to new bad deals that have awful termination language and are actually incredibly expensive to exit relative to what they were before. Jesus. Immediately before they exit and now are in a weird position where they need to either pay out or try to use the TPA. Now again, now we'll get to the actual dramatic part. So now you, we've set the stage of they're out of the league uh, they don't want to pay the severance because it's a ton of money suddenly that they weren't anticipating. And they, it's it's fine. They're free. The, Riot gave them their out. They're getting their eight, $10 million, whatever, and they can just leave and use the TPA rule. False, because guess what hasn't happened yet? Or at least as my understanding as of like yesterday or the day before. I mean, they haven't actually been signed the deal, right? Riot yeah. hasn't actually terminated the TPA. They haven't actually right. been formally legally removed from the LCS, but... NRG did formally legally hand out these effectively forced uh, pseudo mutual terminations saying we don't owe you any money. Also, you don't work here anymore. Also, we've cut off your salary, your payment, everything, right? So they're they're now no longer paying these people uh, effectively at this moment uh, the money that they probably should be owed. And they're trying to use a rule that's not actually in effect right now. 
to like a dodge paying the severance. Now, again, this is like a couple days old now. So there's obviously some wiggle room for like they came back and just started paying them or whatever. My understanding is, though, is that they were trying to hold to this line and it escalated such that the PA is now handling everything. Oh, like okay. this is like straight up like a PA issue. The players are working directly with, I would assume, Phil and the, the board of the PA. And they are like in direct contact across the board with energy of the LCS and everything that's going on to navigate the chaos that is energy saying, well, we just don't feel like we owe them this money anymore. Wild. <laughs> yeah. By the way, the worst part about that is as you may, as you went to pains to point out, the stupid thing is the actual costs mean they could have had more success in the game and kept the original lineup. And instead yes. they've just yeah. like cut off their own nose to spite their face and then lost. So they lost in the game and financially, which is, the, yes. and the reason why that's so egregious as well, David, like you say is if anyone looked at that roster, even on paper and thought these aren't big names, the fucking <laughs> team won because of the coaching staff, you idiots. Like that's the whole, that's what everyone in the industry said is, wow, look what this coaching staff has done and the positional coaches and the scout. Instead, they were like, it's just the players, bro. Keep the players. like, And then even worse, sign them to worse deals. That's so dumb. That is so bad, mate. Yeah, so they specifically fired the general manager, like two of the coaches, and then upsized a handful of the contracts and presumably gave themselves not the greatest exit. Well, remember, but one of those coaches was DeMonte, who went to Flyco and just won this championship now a year later. So, yep. yeah, good, good one, guys. Good, good one. <laughs> um. I mean, I think from the energy standpoint too, like their exit is obviously going to get messy and you'd think that, you know, from the situation you might see lawsuits resulting, right? Um, but we, when we go back and talk about, you know, their goals, Dana, which is like to pump the valuation of the org, mm -hmm. you know, what actually happens is they come in, okay, so they cut costs. And as we said earlier, the stipend has increased. So I would imagine energy was still running comfortably, profitably. Yeah. Then Riot comes and they say, guess what, guys? It's new team participation agreement time. Here's the new <laughs> stipend. And everybody's like, oh, shit. Like, it's a well, lot less The bigger money. news, hey, the new TPA you can't sell. Obviously, yeah. that has to be the death knell to everything they were planning. Because if you come in, you're like, okay, even if we have to ride this for a few years, we've got the stipend to cover the difference. Our esports division is no longer plummeting. Maybe they even get a biz dev team going and start building it up. And the second they're stable, surely somebody wants to buy an LCS slot. My understanding is in the immediate, nobody wanted to buy an LCS slot because a handful had just turned over first. And then right. second, Riot had started floating this like, why don't we just go to VCT and then you can't sell slots anymore. So then suddenly, absolutely nobody wants to go buy the NRG LCS or nobody wants to buy NRG proper because nobody wants to buy NRG the LCS slot for a slot that you can no longer sell anymore. Like maybe you could buy it for, I think the cheapest we heard was like 10 or 15 with like the Shopify FlyQuest deals. It's like, what are you going to do? You're going to go buy a slot for 10 or 15 that Riot's going to buy you out of at now we're hearing 6 to 10? I think Ooh. the FlyQuest deal was like 20 and Shopify was like 12 million, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, those are rough numbers, guys, off, uh, I recall off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point because if you guys don't know, in Valorant, the model is that you're a, you're a partner, but you can't actually sell that slot. You know, hence why like EG couldn't sell to FlyQuest, even though they like FlyQuest was like trying to buy it, right? It was like, uh, uh, uh you can't sell the slots. Yeah. These are, our, we are the kings and, and these are our nobles that we have knighted, right? And you can't, you can't sell your, your, your rank, <laughs> basically. I mean, put um, it this way, like the thing that I is the only level, Monty, that philosophically you could get to riot. They think of themselves as a monarch. So obviously yeah. to actually get any power, you have to recapitulate the Magna yes. Carta of and course. just, you can be a noble. Woman who shares a tiny bit of power. Yes. And that's said, yes, that's I see philosophically where you go. And they can strip you of your title, you know. <laughs> the thing yes. that I, the thing that I despise about that is like, and I I don't know enough about the, the law uh in America, but it seems to me to be a ridiculous system that I can sell you a franchise slot, right? So it's an asset that you buy into, but also down the road I can change the agreement to be you can't sell. Like, or if you do sell, but, we have final but say. This is, this is the, so the original contract said that this year they were renegotiating the contract. So the terms right. can change now. Well, and, is, and there's also, I, I can I can draw like a more clear line for you specifically on this one, Richard. So okay, the original thanks. structure to the league was not, Riot gives a bunch of money to teams every year to operate. The original structure was the stipend minimum guarantee was actually very low. Okay. And then eventually the revenue is going to come through. So the MG doesn't matter. We're never going to like worry or think about it. It's not going to be a thing. Riot screws up the BAM tech deal. Riot screws up the other sales deals. Riot has FTX happen. And the owners say, hey, this isn't our fault. You screwed this up. Riot goes, yeah, you're mm -hmm. probably right. 
Let's raise the MG to account for this. We should be having more revenue. We should have money coming through. You should be making money off the league. So here, we'll just raise this up. And Riot's basically just financing the league as an apology to screwing up the deals. Yep. And then over time, that just like sits and sits and sits and sits, and it never gets reconciled anywhere, okay. which is whatever, until you say, okay, we want to enter a new world. And the teams are like, no, we want to stay here. That MG is not guaranteed to stay that high. It was an apology. Eventually, the apology runs out. Riot has the unilateral right to just change that MG at certain periods, in this case, now, as Monty's saying. So Riot has the ability to just go, okay, old MG, like it's the old one. We, we're supposed to, you're supposed to get your money from revenue, so we're going to go back to the revenue model. MG is now $500,000, whatever we want it to be. So you no longer can operate a team using exclusively Riot stipend. So the threat is, oh yeah, you don't have to sign the new TPA. You don't have to move to the new one. You don't have to let us buy you out. But if you don't, we're only paying you $500,000 a year. And our rules <laughs> really operating a team costs $1.5 million. So we're yeah. forcibly making it so you're losing a million dollars no matter what. Um, and, and to energy's okay. point, like when they're coming in and they, they like kind of accidentally win LCS, let's be real. They didn't expect to, you know, show up and win in their, no, first it was just a good decision roster. making by CLG, a good GM to be clear. Sure. Everyone likes to tout the coach thing. They only lost one coach. Like just to be super clear, they got rid of two and they added another one back immediately. Yeah. They just wanted to make a swap. The biggest change. And I'm going to swing in this to the top of the mountain. Obviously everyone knows it's one of my mentees, John. The Kamikaze Platypus, the GM yeah. there is the yeah, actual yeah. significant change they made. And he does have so a very good from, reputation. In, he, has a, he has an amazing pedigree, the... and he went from LCS champion to unemployed in real time as uh, CLG then just completely, or well, I guess NRG catastrophized over the course of a year and has now exited the league. <laughs> Right. And, and, you know, I think your, your points about their goals, you know, make a lot of sense and whether MSG knew or not. I mean, what we can say about MSG definitively is that they wanted out of esports because it's not just that they sold the LCS slot. Yeah. They got rid of their, uh, you know, women's everything. counter-strike team. They got rid of their smash players. They got rid of everything. Right. They well, they released, they released the financials, didn't they? Um, where they showed like all of the other entities in their portfolio and they were all like profitable and making money. And then it got to the esports division. And it yeah, was, to be clear, it, it, yeah. it was very ham fisted too. Like CLG Red, like looks like a cute, like a cool story on the other side of it because it worked out. They mm. weren't like great about trying. They weren't trying to rehome anyone across the board. The LCS people landed on their feet only because Riot mandates you have to have people in seats to do the job. So yep. NRG like effectively begrudgingly accepted those contracts. And every single other feasible person that could be released across the entirety of CLG was released across the board, including all of these different CLG pieces and entities like CLG Red that just luckily got scooped up by like FlyQuest, for example. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, that was not like a like well-intentioned, we sold them because it's a better home. Right. It was, we're dropping all this out a window. Nobody's going to land on their feet. Oh crap. Like, I guess at least FlyQuest is going to try to help. Right. And and I made this point on on Summoning Insight, but it's like you can do some theoretical math about, you know, what what this was, because you have to understand, like, how much equity in NRG is MSG really getting? Right. Because it's sure they're getting, you know, NRG is getting an asset that's worth money, but the run rate and the costs of acquiring that asset and, and continuing to hold it are significant. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's like I said on SI, like, let's just say they gave 20 percent to the company, which is probably very high. If we're, yeah. if we're being honest, uh, that's probably a high number, but we're going to, we're going to give like the most, uh, I would say cynical take on this. And you'll see why this was probably a very good deal. Now, if we think about the valuation of NRG, okay. You said like they were, val they were trying to sell their esports division for 15 or $20 million. Or that was their best offer. It's one of those. Two sure. Things or that was their best yeah. offer. So let's, let's do some pretend math here. Let's say that we give them a very generous valuation of eight X revenue, which is what you would typically give a tech company and not like a fucking media company, which they actually are right with their Fortnite Streamers energy and castle. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. What if, Minecraft dudes and full squad gaming and everything else that they own. Um, now if we're saying, okay, they, they sold 20% of their company and let's just say it wasn't $10 million that riot offered them to get the fuck out. It was $8 million. Okay. So they would have to, let's just pretend like they're making you know, if they have a $40 million valuation, so $8 million is 20% of that, which is, you know, 
they would have to be making five million in revenue a year. I do not think NRG, especially their esports side, is making five million dollars in revenue a year. I don't think that they're making that. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in essence, what they did was they did the equity swap, right? And then Riot comes along with the bag, and that bag is eight million dollars. And what they essentially have done is I don't think they lost money this last year because again, Riot increased the stipend. Right, which the that MSG would not have known was going to happen probably when they when they gave the equity swap to NRG. So yeah. what they basically did is they sold whatever percentage of their company at probably above the value of their valuation for eight million dollars. So what they did was they actually just rate in essence, they created a fundraising round that was more money than they would have gotten for selling that equity in the first place. So it's pretty fucking smart, actually, yes. of NRG to do this. And now they can use that money to do things that will actually make them money like their influencer slash, you know, streamer business. And now mm -hmm. they have a massive injection of capital and probably MSG. And the question is, did what did MSG sign off on this? Why wouldn't they have signed off on this? They wanted out of esports. If you're on the board and you're like, wait, we can get more money than this equity is worth. And we don't have to have the costs of running this and we get the fuck I'm out. I'm amazed how many Sign people in esports can't understand the concept that it's positive if you're losing a million a year to just not lose a million a year in the future. They're like, no, but how do I make money off that? It's like, no, no, it's <laughs> by not losing the money, you keep the money. You see, that's like, it's, it's like, you get what I'm saying here? They're like, no, no, but, but why would they do that though? Like, you know, they weren't making money. It's like, yeah, but what the point is. Let's take it all the way back to the beginning. The point is the LCS model doesn't work. Therefore, everyone yes. has realized high, low, or medium, it doesn't work. In fact, I'll even throw this out there. This is also why the LCS walkout was so poorly framed in terms of the overall issue, because it was framed as, look at these dickhead small orgs that are trying to min-max, which we've just said is the only logical thing you should do in the league. And instead, we've gone, they're not spending all the money like on a pointless NACL team and paying everyone 100k to play there. And I remember thinking, like, guys, what are you actually arguing for here? Like this is what you're arguing for will never happen. And even worse, you're actually arguing against the only thing that currently allows people to survive. So I think the whole thing's just so weird in that sense. Because right. for some reason, mm -hmm. people still have like a mentality that if you leave in the LCS, you you think you're gonna like win financially. But actually, as you're saying, Monty, this is a rare case where someone did. Someone well, actually sort of found the right idiot to play out. This is gonna be the only these are probably the only two that win. <laughs> Ever. Right, logically, yeah. Let me let me simplify this enough for you guys. So basically, it's just a math problem. It's we gave up whatever percentage of equity to MSG. Do we want to continue? Do we think that the asset is going to increase in value? The answer is no. By the way, the LCS asset is not going to increase in oh, value, gosh. especially if Danan, if like Danan says, they can't sell the asset anymore. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So if that is true, then the question is this: What is the valuation of your company based on the revenue? Okay, whatever that valuation is, then it's the percentage that MSG owns. If that number is less than eight to ten million dollars, you make money. And also it's just good because and it almost certainly think, is. It almost certainly is less than that one. It almost certainly is. Like you would I think you would have to be very generous. Um and and even then, like, you know, MSG already owns this percentage of your company, so you can't fix that problem. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, now we have just a bunch of money to use on whatever we want to make our business grow in ways that we think is actually going to be better in the long run. And honestly, guys, if you don't know, energy, as you, as, as we've been pointing out, they have a pretty sizable influencer business and they have yep. this other business called full squad gaming, which is like a TikTok channel that does a gazillion views, by the way. So I think that what they are considering is that the real play here, now that they are no longer an Overwatch League with the San Francisco Shock, now that they're no longer an LCS with NRG, they can actually just cut ties with esports and use all this money to develop their influencer channels, which are probably doing a lot better, if we're mm -hmm. if we're being honest, financially. Well I mean, the and this is thing the same in the modern day. All the esports teams have been dreaming about. <laughs> well, of course, yeah. that's why TSM's gradually shedded their teams and gone to a min-max role in games like CS where they don't have to be the top team and spend millions. No, the stupidest thing is the epiphany these teams have had, the idea they see an epiphany that says everything about the industry, is, wait a minute, the esports thing, that's just a bloody money sink. Why don't I just run a media company where people like, you know, the model makes sense? Like, the joke is, instead of signing a world-class League of Legends player for millions to play for NRG, the team, 
stream, you are absolutely better off having like Tarek just be a core streamer and pay him hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever. Like that, that one makes a million times more sense. So or like, investing just... in Last Free Nation, yeah. the podcast network. <laughs> that Debatable does... on that one, but <laughs> when's the last free co stream? <laughs> um, yeah, it depends on who you are, if we like you. Uh, yes. but. Uh, you know, it, it, there, there are, there are a lot of different, you know, approaches you could take right now, but I do think that a lot of the organizations that we're going to, and you can talk to this day then, like every single org has different businesses, right? And for, yes. a, for an organization, let's take cloud nine, for example, because cloud nine is one of the very, like he's, it's a pure esports org. They only do esports really. Mm -hmm. Like they don't have a big influencer business. Team liquid has their media, their production company, and they've got liquidpedia, like TSM has all their websites, you the know, race a lot of first thing right now. Yeah. Yeah. The race, the world first thing, like a lot of these companies have diversified in different ways, but cloud nine is like pure esports basically. Yep. Um, and when we look at this, like what other choice do they have besides staying in? And you could say, well, why is hundred thieves staying in guys, hundred thieves, they fucking sold all their other businesses. Like I, I, Nate shot on a podcast recently said, I would not do the esports thing again, but they yep. already sold their energy drink business. And Nate shot said they basically broke even because it costs so much money to put it, you know, to actually start the juvie brand. And they sold it to some company in like Wisconsin or some like a beer company in Wisconsin. He said they basically just broke even. Uh, they were trying to develop a, a gaming title, which they then got rid of because obviously like hundred fucking thieves is not going to develop. They don't have hundreds of millions of dollars to develop a triple A gaming title. And someone just dropped exactly what they were trying to do. Like a couple months after they announced what they wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like um, a large developer was like, that was a good idea. We already did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. I mean, it's not their core competency. Yes. So I think they still have high ground, which is their keyboard brand, and they have their you know apparel. Yeah. So it's not like they're not somewhat they have diversified. Fully split them away from a hundred thieves. They are no yes. longer under a hundred thieves. They are effectively in parallel. Uh, my last little big tidbit today oh, okay. is that IMT NRG are obviously the thing we're talking about. That's all fun and exciting, interesting to hear the drama around NRG and talking about IMT as a business. They weren't the teams that were front running the entire time, this whole time about who's exiting. We knew there were two leaving, like that was overwhelmingly gonna be the case um, from day one when they were looking at this pivot towards a VCT model with guest slots and everything. The other front runner, pretty constant, um, was 100 Thieves. Like right. they, they were like, my understanding is That's pretty sincerely up, yeah. open to we're interested. I don't even know if they're like, I don't know if they ever came around to like, okay, no, actually we love the LCS we're staying in, we can do this. I or just don't think they, they have like, any other businesses anymore, like Cloud9. Like they, well, they my point is that these, some of these teams think, have to be involved because they've got nothing else. Well, and I think part of it is also like Riot is who's picking in part, who's leaving, and like making these offers out, and so they can be pretty selective about like the amount That's that true. they offer and like who they offer it to when, and like it's a bit of a negotiation. And it wouldn't shock me at all if Riot was like, yeah, it doesn't matter if a hundred thieves wants out. Like we're not even gonna like put a number in front of them. They would consider accepting. Yeah. Because like that brand being involved is a thousand times better than like dragging forward more IMT or dragging forward more energy, right? Yeah, I mean, what what does it say about the state of of the league as a whole? I mean, like you know, it it, it seems to me the way like all the messaging around the league is like it's super positive. We're merging with Brazil. We're doing all this super cool shit. Viewerships, you know, they're lying about the viewership numbers again, misrepresenting, you know, how well it's done through the art of co-streaming, the dark art of the co-streaming numbers. Um, and, you know, they've, they've got this commissioner who is just the fucking mouth of Sauron. You're the best Zimmerman <laughs> who just comes out and just says utter bullshit, utter nonsense like on its face. Like I did a video recently recently talking about they said big ideas come into the league guys we're gonna turn on twitch subs yeah if only you'd done that <laughs> at the fucking start you would have had an a even bigger ago. war chest yeah you would have had a massive war chest of money and you would have you, developed you literally the left tens of millions of dollars yeah, on that yeah exactly just because you were the the sheer hubris of it because you were like no we're, we're never going to create a division we we want to grow the pie by having everybody watch it for free all of the time yeah how's that working out but anyway the messaging around the league is that everything's great it's in rude health we're merging with brazil even though brazilians are crying about it it's going to be better for the future of the game numbers are up potentials up twitch subs are on and yet people are still wanting to have a fucking brexit on the lcs and you know and, and by the, these orgs are the type that theoretically 
They need the LCS if they're serious about esports, which, of course, we know they're not. But, I, I, you know, I've heard behind the scenes. Now, I'm not as, you know, juiced in in league as you guys. But I do talk to a lot of owners, a lot of managers, a lot of sources for other stories just so happen to work at these orgs and they hear shit from other departments and stuff. And I've heard, once again, other orgs want out. That It's not just Immortals. It's not just NRG. Like, well, it's not just it, League of Legends. Yeah, yes. <laughs> the, these orgs in the LCS, they, 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 they are done. They are done so manifesto. They want out. They, 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 it is, it, they're looking at Immortals and NRG and going, you lucky bastards. <laughs> Being mm -hmm. the, that, like, so what, like, what does that say about the state of where the game's going to be? Like, when are Riot yeah. going to wake well, up to the fact well, that this is not the product it once was and you are in a terminal death spiral? I want to touch on something quickly, which is like uh, the the confusion and like the the weird like inability to understand where where Mark and I'm not even going to say Mark. I'm just going to say rioters are coming from. Hmm. I can say I even felt trapped to this, which is like it's actually really easy to be optimistic and excited when your contract and your salary are like entirely insulated by a multi billion dollar entertainment entity. So like I, I felt that with the Warriors, well, like I was literally my my entire job my job was like locked behind a, a multi billion dollar NBA entertainment conglomerate um, with all the excitement in the world for anything, and they're like it doesn't Sounds matter. Good, right? if, you know, well, they can they'll say things like it doesn't matter if the worst thing on the planet happens if the the stock market drops 50 percent today, we're still a billion dollar entity and we're just fine and we're gonna we can navigate and we're creative and we've done this before. Oh, it's the same way, right? Like when you when you walk in there and say, "Hey, maybe we should be more forward publicly. Maybe we should talk more about the struggles we're facing as a business. Maybe we should like make this more relatable and understandable to the audience. Maybe that's going to be what helps us find our pathway forward." They're like, "We're Riot. Everything's totally fine." Because like for the for Riot it, it, in a vacuum, or relevant to the teams and the players and all the other things, everything's totally fine. League of Legends makes tons of money. is fantastic. Valorant's super successful. Great. They got a fighting game coming out. Everyone's excited for. Uh, honestly, their expenditures probably went down dramatically because they lopped off like half their MMO team. Yep. Across the board, things are fantastic for you know Riot, the multi-billion-dollar entertainment conglomerate. So when you're Mark or you're someone on the LCS and you're working for that group and they say, "Yeah, your contract's fine and everything's going to be okay," it's really easy to get in front of a camera and be like, "Yeah." Mm. It's it's also that cool. <laughs> unfortunately, you know, this this is why developers shouldn't be operating tournaments because there is a there's a mismatch in incentive, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a sports league, the teams are all aligned on the business incentives of making a popular entertainment product. Well, when you only have the teams. And yeah, when you only have only. the teams, like you have an American <laughs> sports league. The problem with Riot is that everybody in, inside Riot, so the teams don't actually get to select league leadership. Like Mark Zimmerman is not selected by the teams and the teams have no, sh no, no say in the leadership. And the leadership of Riot Esports is only incentivized to help Riot Esports and not help the teams. Like they don't give a fuck about the team's business really, if we're being honest. Like mm -hmm. they will literally give them the bare minimum scraps to keep them involved. Uh, you know, and to they, keep it's themselves not, from getting sued. That was a lot of the them, MG yes. raise was like, we yep. screwed up these negotiations and made a lot of big promises. Right. So yep. like, here's some money, sorry. <laughs> right. Um, and, and yeah, I think, I think a lot of this is, it's not that they don't care. I think that team liquid and cloud nine and these names that have legacy and the fans like, are there, they do, they don't want the, to get rid of these teams and replace them with fucking team Marn again. You know what I mean? That, yeah. that would obviously be bad for the league. It would be bad for league of legends and it just looks terrible in terms of PR. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, these people within riot esports are incentivized, you know, they are not esports lifers. A lot of these people are trying to climb the corporate ladder to get somewhere else in gaming or riot. They do not care about the esports ecosystem in the long in 10 years, right? They care about doing the best thing they can at, for riot in order to leave esports. They want be a LinkedIn profile to show riot games three years, like the MBS, so, you know, they want all that shit on their LinkedIn, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at look at John Needham. He just took an, an additional job beyond being the co-head of esports into publishing, which is where he comes from, by the way. Yep. So, yep. but it's like, he's not solely responsible for esports anymore. He is getting promoted or, I mean, you, you guys interpret this how you want. He's either getting promoted to do other things at the same time, or Riot is saying esports is not a full-time job anymore because we don't give a fuck.
So you pick which one you think that is. Um, could be both, right? I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe just he's this. just that qualified and capable. <laughs> You know, I'm 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 gonna just say this. This is absolutely <laughs> the 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 future, and there's been swirlings behind the scenes uh, of people saying that this is absolutely happening. Um, Saudi is going to take over the LCS. Yes, I'm Saudi right. is going to take over the LEC. Yep. They are going to run the English language. Uh, yep. uh, uh, they'll take over international events. Yeah, too, yeah, yeah. And they'll they've already got it with the esports World Cup. That's happening, guys. Like I'm pretty much like 95 percent certain that is the future. That's mapped out because whenever whenever these riot executives talk now they and, keep flying to saudi arabia weirdly too why are they all there all the time it's fucking I mean, it's, it's, it's it's wonderful this time of year monty you've really got to go you know get out there see the sights, nothing, the nothing like a summer in riyadh i hear yeah, it's really catch, well, I catch hear your it's local just, beheading maybe have dinner with mbs while you're out there you know. yeah why not i mean he is the most, he's list. the most interesting celebrity of all time according to uh yeah, legal players so yeah fake yeah um so look i mean you know that that's absolutely where it's going and, and and another giveaway in all of this just how far down the pecking order actually the esports product has become is when you go and look at like you say with john needham what's his title now but also when mark merrill's flying out to riyadh and so again i know people in these rooms um you know like he's introduced himself now he thinks he's a tv producer he doesn't think he's got anything to do with games development anything to do with esports he doesn't he, he, he as far as he's concerned like arcane is now like it's the, the, you say that like he's coming in like we are the magic yeah. man we are yeah the yeah, yeah. Dreams. yeah. Like, like, yeah. Ah. for real oh, for, for real, real dude no, for real idea, like, Richard, like, like in the show of succession our tv show of the esports industry obviously when mark merrill walks in the room in saudi suddenly like a like a like a hench guy just goes like uh, Richard, he's in the building. He's he's entered the building now. We've got we've got Mark Merrill yeah. on the on the flank, and I just, uh, I, I just I love Mark it. Merrill, I, I love Mark the Merrill idea of Mark Merrill session. walking into a room, being like, "Did you guys know that I'm the artistic genius who created Yordles?" Yes, like, <laughs> Mark Mark, Mer Mark Merrill watched Succession and didn't understand it was a satire. He thinks it's brilliant. He thinks it's a, he thinks it's an actual documentary level about how to be successful in business. Uh, you know, and, he just you know, plays that theme tune as he's like shaving in the morning. Getting yeah. Ready. <laughs> right, so he's 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 going to these meetings now and saying, you know, I'm the guy behind Arcane. Uh, I've got great ties with Netflix. That's not the end of the content. He they Some they're call me make, the Shakespeare of video games. They do. They, yeah. They, they, <laughs> yes. Um, and and that's that's where his attention is. And a lot of riot executives now have arrived at the conclusion that a lot of the, uh, the orgs that were in the league are. It is better to be a media company. The appetite for video games media has gone up and up and up. The appetite to pay for esports product has gone down and down and down. I mean, like you know, it, we all get, we all arrive back at the same fucking you know starting point. If you can't get the fans to pay for something, then is it a product worth pursuing? And the answer about esports is no. Until the fans want to pay pay per view or watch the big events, want to buy merch, you know, on mass, you know, at scale, you know, so it's actually uh, worth it, you know, because I remember all the morons pretending, oh, if Team Liquid had signed Faker, shirt sales would have paid for the. Uh, you're you're mentally <laughs> ill, like that. That 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 is never true, like. The, the compared to an average sports org, merch sales is an infinitely small Thanks. slice of the pie for an esports org. People are not out there, you know, and you won't, you know, it yourself outside of an esports event. How many jerseys do you realistically see? Like, maybe if you walk around Copenhagen, you might see a lot of Astralis jerseys, but that is like not true when you go to a major American city. You know, you will see I mean, like the maybe answer is one. never in America, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, never. so. So it's like everybody knows that the finances on this are broken, but the media aspect of it, absolutely not. In fact, now it's getting, it, we're back to the stage we were in 2015, 2016, when you could unlock money for esports. Now Amazon Prime are looking for programming, Netflix are looking for programming, other little media companies are looking for programming. There's big YouTube channels. The Russian government are out there funding propaganda videos. You can go get that bag. You can get that bag, Tenet Media. That, that's another podcast. Don't worry about it. But um, <laughs> You, you know, the, the the money's out there if you want to make video games adjacent content. Riot realized that. That's the direction they're heading in. And increasingly, they are the, the only people that want to run esports at all is Saudi because they see it as the through road to having a greater amount of control in the Olympics plus that whole sports washing thing. 
All right, I do want to I do want to talk about the plan for the Americas and like the future of the business of League of Legends because it all ties into this because it's like clear that Riot's pushing more internationally. Uh, before we do that, you guys eat good on this podcast with the hot takes. Thank you, Danon, for bringing in uh, the very interesting information about NRG. Uh, but if you want to eat good, not me metaphorically, but literally, please check out our sponsor for this show, Factor, because. They ship you chef crafted, never frozen meals. You can get calorie smart options, protein plus keto. Uh, they are ready in just two minutes. All you have to do is pop them in the microwave. They are great. They have 35 different options every week. Of course, it cycles, so you never get bored. And you can add up to 60 add-ons. So it's like breakfast, uh, protein shakes, whatever you guys want. Get shipped to you in a refrigerator, like a, a refrigerated box. So that has cold packs in there. Throw them in your refrigerator, and then you can eat them all week. It's great. I really enjoyed it in Bay when I was back for MSI. Uh, also, probably healthier than you guys ordering takeout like you do. So, you can cut down on your meal planning, cut down on your grocery shopping, make your life a little bit more convenient, and they are very good as well. So, you can head to factormeals.com slash horsemen, again, plural, horsemen5050, and use code horsemen50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code horsemen50 at factormeals.com slash slash horsemen 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. As usual, supporting our sponsors is the best way to continue to get this content, which only we offer because nobody else is independent media network because they're either owned by the developers, like some other podcasts in all your favorite games, or they're owned by the tournament organizers, which are also owned by Saudi Arabia. So you guys pick where you want your information. Like, I think we provide a valuable service. Probably the, the you know, we, we are holding the line here to a certain degree. Uh, so we do appreciate when you support our sponsors. But let's talk about the America's pivot because a big part of League of Legends now is that Riot has said, basically, domestic leagues are not working. So this entire global franchise model that we did in all of our minor regions where, hey, back in the day, we set up leagues in Turkey and Oceania. By the way, hilariously, OPL, which is the Australian New Zealand Oceanic League, uh, just announced, hey, uh, things are changing and uh, this doesn't exist anymore, but also we're not ready to tell you about the plans for what will exist, which is obviously... <laughs> That's a classic riot Insanely move. ominous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you, know, uh, you could it, say they have the concepts of a plan. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> but it's it's so that that just got announced, right? They're obviously trying to they're rolling that into the Pacific region, but essentially what's right what Riot has been doing over a number of years now, without actually admitting it, is their plan of having all of these minor regions and major regions has failed. The game is not big enough to support all of these teams. They have outright said, we need to reduce the number of teams so that our global revenue pool can pay out more to each team, which is exactly what they're doing um, mm. in terms of reducing these LCS teams paying out. That's what they're saying. That's what John Needham said. Um, and so now what we have are, you know, the Turkish League was rolled into the European Tier 2 system. OPL, does it exist? Who can say? Not Riot, apparently. We know the old thing doesn't exist. Will a new thing exist? God only knows. Um, My favorite part about that is I know that in other esports, Australian CS is, and, and other game Valorant is so small, you can roll it into a bigger region. I just sure. love that one because I just love the insanity of like real world terms related to esports. So China is a region, not a country, but then Australia, that enormous fucking country at the bottom, <laughs> that's a bit, that's literally, even like major cities in Australia are so far apart, the internet isn't like good enough to go between them and have recent ping. We can just say, that's basically like fucking Singapore and Taiwan, isn't it? Just join up there, like, what? Like, I mean, they're so, only like so, 20 million so people It's so insane, I know, so. I love it. It's still <laughs> metal, though, it's still metal, mate. Large land mass, zero people inside of it. Um, So the, the, um, Basically, like we're we're looking at a situation where Riot has been really drawing back on the number of leagues and everything right now. I mean, to our Counter Strike friends here, Thorne and Richard, I'm sure this will amaze you. They have decided that perhaps more international events and higher peak viewership are better. I, shocking. Oh, they've decided revelation. they're going to do esports. Oh, bad, bad. Cool, right? I'm, so they're not just doing the shit version of the NFL anymore. We're doing so, esports. Tell you what, if they're doing esports in 2024, I'm in, right? Shout me so, in. So what they've done is they've added another international event, obviously, moving to a global three-split system. 
Um, you know, they're trying to have more international competition, which I agree with, by the way. I have always agreed with so the as plan. Well, so as well, Monty, as inventing Twitch subs in 2024, they've now realized it's more hype when players from countries that are the best meet each other and sort of clash. Yeah, no, determine more who frequently. The, no, tell you what, these riot guys, Monty, as long as they're, they're allowed... Something, they're cooking. As long as they're allowed to predict once the results are in, they're fucking good, I'll tell you that, man. They've got a your eye, I don't so, I mean, I agreed with the, the merger of the Americas regions because I do think that despite all the Brazilian complaining, which mercifully we haven't seen on Twitter in a while. Thank you yeah, very okay. much. <laughs> Richard, I actually have to ask For you. No reason at all. Right, when you woke up and saw that, you must have thought what I did. When you woke up, it's like the, legally Brazilian people are banned off the internet. You were like, you know what? It's like that thing, you know. <laughs> the the day, I don't agree with the way it's done, but it did need to be done. You know what? <laughs> I mean, listen, I, 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 I have been advocating for a long time. Why can't we just have like a regional block yes. on your Twitter yeah, account? Yeah, that'd be great. Problem <laughs> solved. Problem solved. I, I, I've made the joke before, but I have seen Van Peter's dick more times than yes. Van Peter, for fuck's sake. And 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 now that they've banned him, I, I, the band of Brazilians, I almost miss it. I'm going to have to start dating <laughs> Van Peter to see it again. I'm gonna have to make, it's the only way out, you know. So, All yeah, right. but uh, yeah, there was a little bit like, oh, please, thank you. So, <laughs> as much as people complain, I do believe that we are going to see very large viewership for the planned clashes between North and South Conference in mm -hmm. LCS or in the mm -hmm. Americas, whatever they call it, the Americas region, right? I do believe that the peak viewership of these finals, which they've said are going to happen like at the end of the first split, um, you know, they're going to have like a lock in style tournament, which is exactly what I theorized they were going to do just based on the timing. And it's going to play into more competition between Brazil and North America. Like obviously you get, the Latin American teams in each division as well. Um, we're going to have another international event. Also, Esports World Cup is existing now. How that will exist next year is in question because Riot has stored it. I'm not going to say claimed. Sort of claimed, implied that MSI will still be run by Riot next year. And that and they it will not e be Esports World Cup according to them so far. They, yeah. But there was some very dodgy loopholes it was in the phrasing more than, it was more than msi won't be run by the in yeah, saudi yeah. arabia anytime so like, again like monty said like they put so many like couching like lord bearing words that weren't quite specific that it seemed like they were sort of trying to say monty's wrong but he might be right but only in the spirit of the law not that and do one of those so we'll wait and see on that one i feel like we'll, yeah, we'll wait and see. see you know they, they didn't say that msi is definitely happening and is being run yes. by riot like they could just not do MSI and to just run esports World Cup with the same format. The like, joke is they questions. just renamed <laughs> MSI to not MSI, and then that's run by the side. And then Monty was wrong again. We win. High five, everyone. You know, as usual. Um, actually, the so, mid-year invitational. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> MYI, the only the only worse name than MSI. Um, so, in any case, like the point is, is that Riot is clearly moving to a system where the priority is on these big international events and like huge peak viewership. Um, previously, their strategy was on domestic leagues with domestic sponsors and consistent average concurrent viewership. But they're clearly like trying to pare down domestic competition and hit higher peaks, which, by the way, for all Riot's faults, I don't think one of them has been that they have failed to sell to major international sponsors at international events. MasterCard, yeah. Mercedes, Red yeah, sure. Bull. I think they are very good at selling like the big ticket items. You know, obviously the Louis Vuitton collaboration for Worlds. And so I think they're looking at it now and they're saying, well, maybe our strategy has failed in terms of monetizing every individual league domestically. But if we have more international competition, like our big package deals that we're selling can do better. And th th this is this is clearly like the strategy they're going with moving forward. Like, I don't think that, you know, we're going to have as many viewed hours on on Americas as we had on LCS, you know, and no. CB LOL combined, to be fair. So like yeah. if you say, here are the viewed hours on LCS and CB LOL from this year, I don't think we're gonna have that many viewed hours. But I do think that for the big matches that happen between Brazil and North America, the peak viewership would be higher, the, the hype will be higher. I want to watch it more, frankly. So I like the product better and we get more international events. So I think Riot is actually moving in a good direction with this, to be clear. Now we can ask we can obviously ask the question, why did anything ever have to be done in a different manner? Like why did we have to take 10 years to get here? Because 
people who know esports would have just started with this plan, clearly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it was a dumbass decision, but I don't think it is the wrong one right now. Yeah, I, no, I, I, yeah this cool. all sounds fine. Uh, again, I don't think you're going to find anyone who has the leg to stand on saying that like fundamentally the decision is, is sound for like where they either should have started or where they should go. Those are both at this point the exact same thing. Um, yeah. The question I would actually levy is, uh, is Riot actually capable of like getting it getting it done like is it going to be smooth is it going to work like well, no, there's but, a lot of questions savvy gaming air, like... is don't worry dana okay. savvy gaming is like because there's like so many weird questions around like they just made these like big sweeping changes to nacl and the introduction of collegiate teams there's like this weird league of legends has always had like a multi-week process for playoffs so like how are you going to bring these teams in out and around i've done the visa process both directions both into the u.s from brazil and into brazil from the u.s also not the easiest like fastest thing that's ever happened um so there's just a lot of weird like areas where i feel like we're going to be hanging and yeah like i guess if it's just esl does it it'll be fine but my apprehension is like i don't think riot historically has been known for just releasing authority over what they're doing overnight um and i'm curious what this transition will look like regardless of who ends up actually running it on the other end they're going to want riot people in the room, but I, but I think yeah. you know my 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 read on it increasingly, as I said earlier, is I don't think they care about it to the same degree they used to. No, it's no. like you 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 if you understand who these people are, it was essentially a startup where they hired a bunch of their weirdo friends to be weirdos in a weirdo setting. There's no better place and to their be weirdo fucking... brothers to run their weirdo. <laughs> oh esports. yeah. There's there's no better place to be a weirdo than fucking esports because as t- as we see time and time again you can get away with it for forever. Uh, the system seems to be very stacked in the weirdos' favor, unfortunately, and that's what they did. And they really valued having control over this little dominion of theirs, which was esports. They loved it at the start. You couldn't go to an esports event, no matter how fucking small or insignificant it was, without some riot cunt and a red t-shirt being there, like sticking their fucking fingers in the gumbo, right and t- not just the gumbo, apparently. So, you know, that was just how they operated. They wanted total control over the industry. They retconned history to essentially say, we built the fucking industry. That was totally here when we turned up, but we definitely built it. You know, a glorious emperor fucking designed the light bulb. Don't ask questions. You know, that's what they did. Uh, but increasingly, that's just not true. Like, they, they you, you can tell by the level of hostility and weirdness and the number of stories that are popping up they they are absolutely now more interested in the games development they want to take over the fgc they're more interested in having these ties to saudi arabia and obviously the chinese government so they can make more money to sell those games and all of the products there they're increasingly less interested in esport they're more interested in media and development of tv shows and and what have you and it's like it tells its own story because 10 years ago you you couldn't be involved in league even tangentially without riot trying to fuck you over in some way or bring you to heel now i do genuinely believe they will acquiesce almost near total control of the lcs and lec products over to their their saudi arabian partners over at the savvy games group i see that as an inevitability at this point because what's on the table is they will underwrite it they will underwrite this clearly failing product that everyone wants to you know pull the ripcord on and get out of um, and they will underwrite the money, and also, as we've seen, for good or ill, um, they're, at, they're they're almost as good, if not equally as good, as getting the same big partner brands into their things. And think about the product they've got to overcome. If you're Riot Games and you get in a room with Mastercard, you go, "Don't look at that uh, report about how uh, all, the systemic sexism and uh, all of the creepy weirdo shit." And they go, "We work in banking, mate." We- <laughs> <laughs> don't look at don't look at our reports, motherfucker. Like don't don't look at the things we get up to. And so that's fine. That is a that, that, that you overcome that hurdle. Yeah, pretty we easily we, with, we with let Mastercard part. Mastercard. You know who, who knows what the banks do. Like you know MBS is out there buying bone saws on credit. Like right. But that but that, that's what I mean. <laughs> Meanwhile, if you're Saudi Arabia and you've got to negotiate sponsors and they go ah this 
bloody uh, it's a bit problematic you know when you're soaring up journalists and uh, the tapes getting leaked that you totally ordered it and shit and um you know but but they're they're doing fine they're going ah oh, forget about that we're an independent company you know we're not we're, we're completely removed from that because we we're, we're through a series of shell companies and they 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 had overlapping sponsors they had some overlapping sponsors between the esports world cup and the lcs so honestly I, I I don't see what the downside would be other than the fact that it's another huge esports property going into the hands of the Saudi Arabian state. From Riot's perspective, it would still be the thing that it was always meant to be initially, which was to be some sort so, of weird loss leader to attract people to the game by creating an aspirational element for players. I, I don't want to get too far into this because like this is another show, but there's also some very interesting possibilities uh, based on the TikTok lawsuit that's happening right now, yeah. because if you guys have been following it, um, the the U.S. judges seem to not be buying TikTok's argument that they can't be like forced to sell because of security concerns and privacy concerns uh, by a Chinese-owned company. Guess who's owned by China? Oh, that'd be Riot <laughs> Games. So, like, there is a world, guys, where. Riot, I mean, Riot's lawyers are definitely watching this, obviously. Oh, yeah. But, you know, there's a world where Riot in its entirety is sold to Saudi Arabia. Um, there is a world where the esports division of Riot mm -hmm. is spun off as a separate company, given a, a, an exclusive contract for the next decade to run League Esports, and that entity is bought by Savvy yep. Game Group. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of weird possibilities that could happen here where it's like, well, the Riot Esports division is now in its own independent company that is a subsidiary of Sa Savvy Games, and we have a, a long-term partnership with them as Riot Games, the development company, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's many things that could be happening, but the TikTok lawsuit might might also just force Riot to be sold at some point in time, depending on how that turns out. So, I mean, everybody's looking at this right now. And by, by the way, no one will care if, if Saudi Arabia owns Riot Games because they already own giant chunks of i mean uber yeah. <laughs> disney mm. you know <laughs> well i mean you know already a 10 cent company as well so you know let's <laughs> so we all know about the golden share <laughs> so you know what i mean it's like if it, 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 forget about it it's so it's you, all you, you really have to i mean i i think this is another reason why you you keep seeing like riot executives visiting saudi arabia sometimes somewhat clandestinely um, yeah, they hate it when the LinkedIn crowd fucking <laughs> fucking leak it, Re fuck it up for that. everyone. Yeah, it's like I mean, imagine that. By the way, it's like it's like what are people doing on LinkedIn? It's like it was just in a room with Moloch and Baal, like, 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 <laughs> negotiating <laughs> for souls. Like, no, don't post that shit, man. Like, fucking the other people in that room, especially, don't want you posting that shit. So it's fuck actually are you so doing? good. Like, yeah, um, it's ridiculous. Like, but we we, we go, we've got to go soon. But before we do that, I want to yeah. talk about the new structure in America's for tier two. Dan and get your take on that because mm -hmm. what's very interesting is Riot has basically said so what in, back in the day that in the promotion relegation system because remember we're basically moving in that direction again with the guest slot they don't want the teams to be like selling because famously like you know you were on cloud nine like they would put together a group of players I have literally get them sold promoted, LCS slots yes and, and then sell the <laughs> LCS slot which was a great business don't get really? me wrong it was great um, they were allowed to do it. I don't blame them for doing it. It was a great mm -hmm. business. Um, they clearly don't want that to happen again. And we've seen teams like now start to, re you know, the teams that were still running Academy rosters have started to release those Academy players. And mm -hmm. there's a, a big question around whether, I mean, I assume the reality is that Riot is not going to let, you know, they'll let teams have Academy rosters, but they will not let them become the guest spot, um, yes. which then loses a lot of value. For You're the teams that part are bankrolling. Yeah. So right, part continue. one has been right now, they were intending on not letting them have teams. I think they were just kind of assuming that once you weren't able to sell the slots, like once they like reinforce that it's gonna be more VCT than it is old LCS, um, that teams would be like, Oh, okay, well, this isn't really worth it anymore. Like, you know, we'll just like pull our talent from whatever teams exist down there. Um, and they were just wrong, right? There were multiple teams saying, hey, no, like, this is important to us. We care a lot about it. It saves us money because we can get cheap players in the future. Like, we'd rather pay them, you know, like, whatever the minimum requirements are now and then bridge them onto, like, a super cheap LCS deal than have to, like, let them be on the market and available in the offseason. Um, it's just it's just a pipe, better pipeline for us. 
And so Riot, I think, kind of was like, oh, wait, okay, well, we weren't anticipating that. You would think that when you're building like a big, cool, comprehensive pivot for your program, when you're like going like, okay, the LCS is now the North Conference. And when you do all of this like big, grandiose stuff, um, you probably would have checked all the boxes and gone through all of your different systems and mechanisms that you and the levers you can pull on for when you're building this so that you just pull the switch and everything transfers. That's my understanding is not at all what's happened here. It's kind of a like, these are cool ideas we want to do. We should be international. Let's like get some involvement. And all of these other considerations are almost exclusively secondary and thrown to like, we'll deal with it later. And later always hits what I call the great world's delay at Riot, where they just go offline for the better part of two and a half months for anything that's not specifically faker at worlds um and so we're in a weird spot where there isn't an understanding even for like the, the collegiate teams on like what this new guest slot looks like how it works what like full-time part-time means around like the guardrails riot always has had with these leagues uh, there's no understanding of like what this format's going to be around like timeline what's going to be accessible what other alternative events are going to be similar to what happened with vct again this is all just like you, it should be charted territory. Riot literally just did this in BCT, but so far yeah. it is entirely uncharted. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's not really like any intention or understanding. And it's all kind of been shoveled behind like, well, we got to get these teams out of the league first and we got to get these TPAs terminated and we got to like, we got to deal with worlds. And like, there's all these other considerations that are, I guess, at the front of their mind. So this new like guest slot and like having academy teams is like a cool conversation. But I'm going to tell you right now, we have probably, we will probably make more progress on like understanding what's worth doing in this conversation that maybe riots even been able to do on their own time right now <laughs> uh yeah it's it's a mess i mean look I, I don't understand it either it's like well i do i i, I mean I, i've already outlined why it's happening but it's like you know you would think there would have to be some sort of feeling some sort of sentiment towards their partners that are affected by this this is another aspect of it i never understand why these orgs get in bed with the developer because ultimately when when push comes to shove you're not you're not even a phone call they never they never consult they just mm -hmm. do the thing and then they turn around and say well, right it's not a partnership there's no business well, yeah. transparency to the success yeah, of the they, marketing they, model they, it's a dictatorship they specifically, yeah but they specifically use the word partner Okay, you're so right. it is a dictatorship. I, I actually have a really funny story about this very recently. So obviously we've been talking about throughout this conversation how the MG has been going down. That minimum guarantee is going from somewhere in the 2.25 range down to somewhere in the 1.25-ish range. Mm. For Riot, that sounds like a stellar deal. They already cut off two teams last year. Let's assume those two teams were probably at like the 2 million minimum guarantee window. So this last year, just 2024 of LCS, Riot saved $4 million, probably minimum, on their year over year, what they were paying out, right? Fantastic deal for them. The minimum guarantee only went up, you know, 250-ish thousand across, you know, in this case, eight teams. So about half of that money got lopped back up, but Riot still retained about $2 million in their pocket compared to last year. This yeah. year, they're lopping off two more teams. But now the MG is up to 2.25, so going into 2025, the actual savings are going to be 2.25 twice, and then the original two from last year. So next year's LCS, when it comes to like what it looks like across like a two-year span, Riot's saving yep. almost $10 million over right. two years. That's one FTX that, sponsorship, by God. Yeah, but, but here's the crazy, here's the funny thing, and this is like, I'm going to tie it back to what you're saying about why would you want to partner with the teams. A lot of the teams were like, Honestly, as long as I stay in, this is fantastic. Riot's a great partner. They're going to be taking teams out. Because of that, they can kick that money back to me, right? Right. So you would think, oh, if Riot saved $10 million over two years on kicking teams out, the teams they kept are great partners and deserve to be rewarded for doing a good job. <laughs> Absolutely, apparently not the case, because they nope. have instead dropped the MG by like 40% overnight. Next year, the teams are making basically half what they made year over year. So your reward for being a good partner, a good organization that followed the rules and did the things Riot wanted to do and kept involving yourself in marketing their game is to lose half of your revenue overnight. While Riot pockets $10 million. that's why JoJo million. doesn't have a contract anymore, <laughs> yeah. guys. That's why JoJo yeah. doesn't have While a contract While Riot anymore. pockets $10 million. That's, like, <laughs> that's, that's, the, uh, that's the grace you get for being a good partner, Rich. So it's a, it's a good question yeah. you're asking.
Yeah, but I, you know, it, 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 I, I obviously follow a lot of sports, um, and and in particular American sports. I'm not like uh, Duncan holding on to the NBA dream. I gave up on that, but I'm a big NFL fan. I'm just thinking, like, if this was happening in that league, like. All of the orgs are on strike immediately, <laughs> and we're and we're round the negotiating table. In in League of Legends, it's kind of like well, you know, like M Monty's made the joke about it a bunch of times. They are like reek, you know. It's like uh, uh, they, they they just put up with it, and it's like, well, at least they're not they're not torturing me as bad as they did yesterday. I mean, it's telling. I mean, keep Dana, one of my Dana worked for the Golden State Warriors. I think it's really telling that all of the traditional sports team owners. That yeah, includes right. NRG, by the way, because Andy Miller is a partial owner of the Sacramento Kings, Golden State Warriors, Madison Square Garden, NRG. They're gone. They're gone mm -hmm. from esports. And Correct. these are people, these are orgs that, as Dana said, have billions of dollars to spend. This, this is a blip. This is like, you know, the, the cost of running Golden State Warriors is a tiny percentage of one NBA player contract. Yeah. Okay. And they think this business is so bad that they're just getting the fuck out. Golden Guardian said, I will take $6 million. Please let the punishment stop, Mr. Riot. And that was on right. top of the fact that we at Golden Guardians were one of the more efficiently operated teams yes. and were actually hitting windows of profitability on the back of selling our talent to the teams that were continuing to be irresponsible with their capital. Right. Uh, and so, like, <laughs> I, I mean, I think you when you look at this, and I've said this before, too, which is that you know, sure, we can we can absolutely blame the teams. We can blame the 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 developers. We can blame the TOs. But factually, guys, fucking Twitch isn't even making money. Like, how do you build like fuck esports, man? Streaming isn't profitable. So how how everything is fucked, guys? Like esports is downstream of the fact that Twitch can't make money. And if Twitch mm -hmm. can't make money, how can Twitch give media rights the deals? The problem, Monty, if you notice here, is the original method when esports didn't make sense financially was attach it to a healthy business, and then either <laughs> a the healthy business doesn't exist, or eventually someone's smart enough to realize, wait, so I can just keep living and I can remove the tumor hmm, maybe i will do that so it doesn't work either way mate whether the business that they attach to works or not eventually it just has to be removed and it like doesn't work <laughs> i'm not sure they use that exact right. way of modeling it in the, right. yeah, the, the, the yeah, industry but... but in your analogy obviously we took a fucking small right. tumor and attached it to a bigger <laughs> yes, tumor exactly, exactly. To, to create some yes, sort of just, super tumor it, it, it's just exactly. like a remora but attached yeah. to another remora instead of a shark yeah. there is no apex predator in this food chain it's just it's parasites all the way down the uh, which is the patient does <laughs> there you go <laughs> uh which is by the way my final thoughts and we do need to wrap this up yeah, yeah, uh yeah. but uh basically like that's that's the joke of the esports industry is like if twitch can't be profitable and sports traditional sports operate on media rights deals and twitch can't give media rights deals how the fuck is anything else supposed to work like the entire the entire ecosystem of gaming as viewing entertainment is just fucking busted <laughs> yeah. and uh, guys Amazon can't fucking figure it out. And Amazon has every single opportunity to figure it out. They own the fucking, you know, live streaming platform and they own the the servers. They own, you know, AWS. If they can't figure this out, who the hell can? Like, love to blame people in esports, but it, the problem is much bigger than esports, guys. So that's my final thought. Dana, what, what are your final thoughts on what's going on with the Americas region right now? It's very, been a very interesting conversation. Uh, I'm at least a little bit interested and excited to see kind of the evolution of the relationships between the regions. I think like what we just saw with VCT and America's challenges is kind of cool. And like watching the Brazilian teams kind of like take it to the North American I do like teams. the changes. I, I, I think like that immediately kind of highlights. I don't think that's going to be the trend like historically with where money and how things are spent. Obviously, North America will probably like leverage itself out over time as being the better region. But I do think like getting us in a scenario where we can maybe be winning instead of just absolutely getting blasted by China and Korea for like another 10 years, that's probably a good deal. I think if we like trend, you know, like North America wins seven out of 10 years against Vladam and Brazil, um, mm -hmm. I think that'll like probably tie into what more of the LCS should have been in the first place and give us an opportunity to not just be that absolute joke that we are at Worlds every single year. So I'm excited. I My, my frustration is I wish this just was happening faster, sooner, quicker. I don't like that, like, the teams that won don't get the guest slot this year, like, even though they obviously are, like, the 
best theoretical tier two teams. Like, I don't like that this transition with the IMT energy isn't smoother. Like we talked about all the chaos surrounding all of it. I feel like when you're Riot and when you're a multi-billion dollar again conglomerate, you have the opportunity to just make these things not be so painful. And every single time they just continue to be. So I wish those were different, but otherwise I'm excited. I think we summarized it all. I've said my part about what I thought about the VC stuff. I don't really have a final thought on this. I will say, just as a one thing I do find a bit surreal about this whole thing, that the actual proposition, like I say, is the juxtaposition with where LCS once was as a major region is crazy. Like, if people don't know, not only was it a way more viewed region than Europe, even though, by the way, you could argue at the time already the European teams on aggregate were slightly better and placed better at Worlds, etc. But the craziest thing of all is the business gap. Like, if people don't know, Monty would have to tell me that the game guess would be but if i had to speculate like in season three and season four what like the best korean players in the world got played it was probably something mental like fifty thousand dollars a year oh, yeah. like For i'm sure. talking about even like faker yeah. and Mata and the the best players so that's where the industry was back then and then as we're saying contrast that with until a year or two ago there were players uh, you actually nailed it did and it wasn't even just that these were players like bid for sometimes the big orgs would just put a top player on their academy team to almost mm -hmm. like deny him to the other teams and to be like if you want him cost you a million too so some of those players were getting paid more than like essentially what eight years earlier like the best player in the world got paid so you can already see how the finance got completely out of whack and then lastly one, one thing I just find really surreal about the fact that the end solution is we have to get rid of the LCS essentially our flagship fucking league it was the first one to be made into the LCS and it was the first franchised one of anywhere I'm not sure actually maybe the LPL was franchised but I'm not certain on that one I think it was around similar time but anyway it was the first franchise league in league not only are we getting rid of it but we're rolling it all up with all of the americas because all i'm going to say is this is when i was a lad and i used to like for the lulls to watch conspiracy videos on the internet there used to be a really famous preoccupation maybe richard remembers it where they would always talk about this future in which they were going to combine all of america through nafta and stuff and make it this thing where there'd be <laughs> this thing the amero which would be instead of the dollar and it was like yep. presented as this crazy dystopian future where you didn't even let this what you You'll have freedom. There won't even be a United States of America. You're just going to remove all the borders. It'll just be one giant. Like, you've actually done that, but in league, that was actually the end goal of bloody League of Legends in the end. Like, so I just find that surreal, personally, where we end up. Again, as usual, politics lead to strange bedfellows. But anyway, all I'm going to say is this. I've tried my hardest not to do this joke on so many different episodes. But I'll tell you oh, what, no, if, if the Saudis <laughs> do take over at Riot, they're not going to fuck around. I'll tell you what, there'll be some heads rolling then. There'll be some heads rolling then. Right, there you go. Save it till the end. No, 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 no that, 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 that's fair. I mean, look, I, 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 I don't have any... Just paste, also a brilliant album. So. <laughs> I, I, I don't have anything really to add to that. My, my, my only differing point is um, I don't share any optimism um, around the league. Uh, I don't think there's any decision that can be made that is going to alter its final destination, which will be to be owned by the Saudi Arabian state. I'm just all in on that reality now. And so, and, and, and even if it doesn't happen, um, it, it's, it's this close to happening right now. And, and that to me just says that ultimately, um, we're probably at end stage, you know, League of Legends, LCS, LEC, all these big leagues. And eventually it should just end up where every esports game should be, which is if you want to run a tournament, you run a tournament and people enter it and you pay what a it. Surprise. And, and yeah. exactly that, that, that that's it's, it, it's, it's only, there's only two ways that, that the game ends up. And it's either that, which is the happier ending or Saudi Arabian state ownership. What a delightful future we have in, for us esports. Thank you very much, Dana, for Indeed. joining us today. Yeah, thanks, man. And as usual, esports Delenda Est.